it's just amazing to think about how you really do attract what you are, who you are. You don't attract what you want. And I think that's where people get it wrong. And that's where I have gotten it wrong in the past is when you don't do the inner work, in my opinion, you're kind of stuck on this like laundry list of things that you think you want. But all of those things you think you want, you're thinking in the mind, oh, this is what I've been told that I want. This is the the Prince Charming, the checklist of the height and what they look like and the eye color and they have good family and they have a PhD and all these things you tell yourself, right? That's all coming from the mind. But when you don't get in touch with yourself, you don't actually know what you want. You don't even really know what it feels like. So I think after I had gotten really in touch with my body again, I was like horribly disassociated. I was so overheating in the mind. I was such an overthinker. Um, That's where a lot of my suffering came from is I was just constantly in the mind. I had no connection to my body. I was like a walking brain pretty much. (laughs) That was like constantly about to topple over because I was thinking too much. And when I got reconnected with my body, that's when it became incredibly clear to me that the woman chooses. It's like, oh, I don't have to just be terrified going out on dates and letting myself be chosen by whoever wants me. It's like, no, wait, hold on. I I have a lot to offer. I have a hot ticket here. And if I'm connected to my body, I can say, it doesn't matter if someone wants me because there are millions of men who would want me. You have to have that mindset in order to be the chooser as a woman. But if you are stuck in scarcity telling yourself, oh my gosh, I might never find someone better than this. Oh my gosh, like what if I mess this up? Oh my gosh, this is such a good guy. Oh my gosh, I will never have an opportunity like this again. That's when you tell yourself all these stories, you don't want to mess it up. You actually choose someone who's not right for you. That's what I kept doing. So I was so afraid to actually say no because saying no would like make this one guy fall away. But when that one guy falls away, you create space for what you actually desire, what you actually want. But when you're in the mind, when you're overthinking and you're completely disconnected from the body, you don't have as much in tune connection with your desires, with what you want. Yeah, I think it's just really important that if you want to attract a higher level person, we need to look in the mirror and see, am I still wearing a mask or not? Yes. Am I only showing 25% of me or even 70, 80% of me? What would it look like to operate life in a way where I'm showing 100% of myself to the world? The moment you show 100% yourself to the world is the moment you will see the world clearly. Mm. And the people who are also showing 100% of themselves, so the real friends, yeah. the ones that you can shoot the shit with and also talk about the deepest things in the world with, yeah. the ones that will congratulate you at your highs and be there for you at your lows, they will come out of the woodwork somehow Yes. And find you. You will attract them and it'll become easy yes. to create your tribe of high quality people. Welcome to Listen Before Love, which is designed to be a series of free-flowing conversations with people who are madly in love. And in order to start this grand adventure, Cam and I are going to share a little bit about our dynamic. And our hope is that instead of getting more generalized relationship advice from folks who you don't even know what their dynamic is, you don't know what they do behind closed doors, you don't know who's doing what, who's saying what, how it feels, that we can explore first me and Cam's dynamic, but then secondly, a bunch of different couples who have different dynamics, relationship philosophies, and ways that they pour love and speak to each other. And so that's what this adventure will probably take shape into. But the first couple of episodes will just be Cam and I sharing our amazing journey together, our story, and for anyone who resonates with our energy to get to know us and see how we keep the love and magic alive every single day with what feels like every second, honestly. Most definitely. I feel like this is a huge passion project for both of us because you and I all day just obsess over human nature, relationships, and everything that comes across love. And so I'm just so, so, so excited for this new chapter for us, this new project we're coming across. And I already know it's going to hopefully help as many people as possible. Oh, my sweetie. I love you so much. I love you too. Where should we begin, darling? Should we begin with how we met? Yes! Let's do it. Let's oh, do it. yay. Okay. You can tell it? 
I want you to go first. Oh, goodness. Okay. So I think what's important before we tell the story is to talk about how we got to the place where we could even meet each other. Because I think a lot of the time when you hear couples origin stories, they are at like the most open hearted place in their lives, which allowed that moment to even happen. So before we even get to that moment, I want to just share what some of my journey was. Of course, Cam's journey is very similar to mine, which is why we bonded so quickly and so easily. So this is a Quick little precursor to our origin story. Everybody who knows me knows I love giving context and the queen of context. So some context on me. So I went through quite a big transformation over the last four years. I had a little bit of a dark night of the soul where I realized that I was very much in my mind. I was a perfectionist. I was a people pleaser. I really struggled to have firm boundaries. I like to say that last four years was a journey into learning how to have an open heart and strong boundaries. And so I was really in a place the last four years where I was getting to the point where I could call in someone as incredible as Cam, my darling. And it took a lot of looking at the deepest wounds that I had picked up in the travels of my life. It took really taking a magnifying glass to my insecurities through so many conversations, most of which were with two of my very, very best friends, Danny and Talia, who you heard a lot about through all of our uh, projects that we've done together. And through those conversations, you basically have to turn over all the stones that you really don't want to look at. So by the time I had met Cam, I had turned over all those stones, I had looked and inspected at the moss underneath the stones, and I had really gotten to a place where if you think about your your soul or your heart as a window, I had taken the Febreze and I had cleaned that entire window completely clean to where Cam was able to come in. I was even able to first see him and then second, be open to what ended up happening and how we met. So that's a little bit about the journey I went on before I could even call in someone as amazing as my darling. But before we tell you the story, I wanna hear what Camp's journey was before we met. One thing you said that really highs to me is how similar our experiences were. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I feel like this is universal for everyone where the growth in romantic relationships actually comes from the growth of the inner work. And so for me over the past two and a half years, you know, two and a half years ago, I was just about to graduate college. I was living an incredibly unaligned life of working in a business that just made my heart shut down and close every single day mm. while still getting all the gratifications of money and what status may come with a high paying job or high paying business. And during that time in my life being 22, I was just casually dating women in college, nothing really too serious. And then one day, felt the need, I need to quit everything and sell everything and move to Bali. So that's exactly what I did. And uh, I had a relationship for that period of time where I realized she was an incredible mirror for me in that I was still a child. And by still a child, I was thinking of myself before the other person, not only in that relationship, but just as a whole, I was thinking of myself before others. And it was this perfect mirror for me to look upon and see that I must be more, I must do more to one day be ready to attract the person I know I'm capable of being with or spend the rest of my life with. Mm. And so after that whole thing fizzled, a bunch of other things in life happened in Bali, um, including a spiritual journey and on and off relationship with that woman, it taught me that the person I was at that time, my external reality was meeting that person of what I deserved. Mm. And so if I wanted to, accomplish everything I wanted to in life and attract the right people, especially a romantic partner, I myself needed to look within and look at the list of attributes I want in a person and then match that. Ask what do those, what does a person with those attributes want in a person they want to marry? And I need to become that. Mm. And then I went on this kind of year long journey of being completely single and working on myself, working on how I could serve others to the highest extent, how I could get all the, I think, big buckets of life in check. And honestly, just learn to love myself. What I've been realizing is that in life, a person can only love you to the level which you love yourself. 
And that was just very apparent. And it was a reason why I think I sabotaged a lot of things in my life. There are people that are coming in my life that were willing to give me an abundance of love I did not yet have for myself. And, and naturally we, we turn those things away, we turn those people away. And it was that year long journey that I had of intro, in, introspection and self-reflection that allowed me to love myself more and then attract you mm. when it was time. And that's a whole story within itself, but <laughs> I, the same gut feeling I had to sell everything and move to Bali was the same gut feeling I had about two years later when I felt as if I needed to move to Austin, Texas, a place I'd never been before, didn't know anyone. And uh, the gut feeling was so strong, I, my mind couldn't rationalize staying anymore. And so I booked a ticket back and, and moved to Austin. And then, um, yeah, a month later, I met you. <laughs> a lot more that went on that Beautiful time, but yeah. Me. I love listening to you talk. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I guess that's why we have podcasts. I podcast. hope so, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, least, at least one person will listen to the podcast. I know, it'll be me. Me, I'll you and me on replay. Listen to the car, yeah. Yeah, no, on one time speed. Perfect. Because I don't need to rush it. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. That means the world. So, one thing that I just want to underscore for anyone listening to this, I think deeply about how you prepare yourself for a lifetime of love. And I strongly believe that doing the inner work is your insurance policy for a lifetime of love. I've, I've written that, I've said that very many times, and I think this is exactly why. Because if one of us had not really taken the time to introspect, turn over all the stones and inspect all of the past wounds and hurt and pain and insecurities, there is a very low chance that we would have been able to even see each other, even have the confidence to talk to each other in public, and then make the relationship work, to be healed enough to hold the giant amount of love that you show for me and I show for you every single day. It takes a clean mirror in order to welcome in someone who truly is the most easy, frictionless partner that you could have. And I think what's really beautiful about Cam and I is that be, because we had both done that work, that individual journey, I didn't, there was part of me, I'll be, I won't lie, who did do that because I knew it would call in the love of my life. There, that was a main motivator for me. I'm not even gonna lie to you. I'm a major hopeful romantic. And a big motivator for me was, if I do all of these amazing work and I get to the point where I love myself so much, it, this person has to find me and I have to find them. So while that was a motivation, I still made the individual personal decision to heal. I didn't have someone dragging me along saying, hey, like go to these retreats in Sedona and get a therapist and talk to this person and do breathwork and somatic healing. I decided to do all that on my own. And I really do feel like that's where a lot of tension comes in, where there is what I like to call a growth gap. So if you resonate with Cam and I's energy, the growth gap happens where one party in a relationship is very passionate about personal growth and healing, and the other party is essentially doing it so they don't get fined. To quote, is that Marshawn? Oh, Marshawn Lynch? Yeah. yeah I'm just here so I don't get fined. I'm just here so I don't get fined. And, <laughs> and it's a subtle energy on that party because they love that person so much and aspirationally you would want to be someone who's working on yourself you would want to be someone who prioritizes personal growth but what i would highly recommend if you resonate with cam and i and our energy and our story is to really be honest with who you are really be honest with what are my values is personal growth one of those values you know, do i want to have a life dedicated to serving people. I think that's what bonds the two of us. We have this shared life vision of service and helping people feel more love and joy and optimism in their lives. That's why we like love spending so much time together, create all these amazing projects together. We are bonded by our shared vision, but we're also bonded by the individual actions we take to make that vision turn into reality. And if we didn't have that power behind our individual decisions, I feel like there would be one case of me being super far ahead of you and pulling you, you know, like, come on, let's go, Cam. And I don't have to do that. Yeah. Like, you you do that and you make that decision all on your own, and so do I. And that's what makes, I think, our relationship so beautiful and powerful together. I completely agree. We've both committed our life to become the highest version of ourselves, And we are 
relentless about it in the most healthy, loving way. <laughs> we are looking for um, the conversation. We're looking for the decision. We're looking for the opportunity that will put us in the best, best position possible to become the freest individual that we possibly can be. The, mm -hmm. By free, I also mean loving. We're mm -hmm. free to love, free to unconditionally love everyone and everything. And it's, it's great for us to say we've done the work, but it's very hard for people to understand exactly what that means. Right. Like I've been to a lot of retreats. I've hired a lot of coaches. I know you've done the same. I know people that have do that for a lifetime, but they're still in the exact same position they were before. Mm. So when we're talking about the work, I want to get incredibly clear tangibly on what that looks like. Please. And in my personal opinion, I believe the work comes from letting go. It's letting go of all the stories that have been created in your mind that do not serve you. Mm -hmm. The stories of who you are, all limiting beliefs around that, along with the stories you have created for the people around you, whether it's the story you've created with your mother, your father, your siblings, your best friend, your college buddies, whatever it may be, whoever is in your life, your boss. These are things that, these stories are what create judgment towards either yourself or them. They create resentment towards yourself or them and also with fear. What you and I have done that I think have primed ourselves to be ready for each other is that we've looked upon all the different areas of life through an objective lens and saying, why do I believe this? Does this serve me? And if it does not, we've set it aside. We've let it go. Now, letting it go, the act of doing so, it can be very complicated at some, but also very simple. Um, it really comes down to being present in the moment through meditation, through breath work, through talking about it, conversations mm -hmm. like this, through crying, yeah, finally you feeling have those to emotions. Drain it. Like what I was talking about earlier with windexing exactly. the mirror that is your heart, your soul, it, it doesn't just fall away. You have to let it out. You have to like give it oxygen in order for it to just dissipate. It's like almost like when you got that crack in your back that's been there and you're like trying to get it out in that final second where you finally release it and it pops and you're like, I feel so relieved. That's what you got to do for all of your insecurities, all your past wounds, all your pain. You have to bring it to the light, let it be seen in order for it to dissipate and almost like evaporate. So I just wanted to share that. Could, yeah, and exactly. And we've always kind of known this. It's it's the I don't give a fuck mentality. That's one of the most <laughs> attractive traits possible. We may have all had that one friend in high school or um, a few celebrities out there that truly just don't care. And for some reason, we love that part of them. Yeah, It's because deep in our hearts, we know that we're capable of that. We just not have allowed ourselves to live that way. And that's a level, of course, I don't think either of us are perfect by any means, but we've gotten to a point to where we've shed a lot of those stories, mm -hmm. those fears, those limiting beliefs. And when doing so, that is exactly what we mean by windexing or cleaning the mirror. And now that our mirror towards ourselves is incredibly clear, that mirror also broadcasts the world and it's clear for us. It's like a one-sided mirror, you yes. know, the side's like a glass window <laughs> people can see through. Yeah. And the level of which your mirror is clear is the level of which you attract everyone and everything around you. Mm -hmm. And we got to a point of clearness in our mirror, not, to, not saying it was spotless, but to a point where we were finally ready to attract our forever person, I believe our soulmate. And I think- I love you. I think, I love you too. I think the reason for that is because we got to the point where we could have the space to be open and receive each other's love and not self-sabotage it. And not, because uh, there's not an ounce of my being that believes that I will one day do anything to ruin this. Mm -hmm. And I hope you feel the same about me. I believe you do. I do, of course. And I believe knowing that I am of a place that I'm not going to ruin a good thing, mm. that I'm going to make the most out of the opportunities given to me, whether it's people, job opportunities, or <laughs> whatever else it may look like, knowing that I'm not going to sabotage that gives me all the faith and trust in the world that I can be the best husband for you, be the best father for our kids, whatever they may look like. And I feel like you feel the same about us when it comes to being the best wife for me and mother of our children. We've gotten to a point where we've built up so much confidence in ourselves because we've wiped away mm. all the dirt on that mirror. Most of it. Most of it. I no, think yeah, that, no. no, no, but I yeah. think like a big part of what we're saying is 
if you do most of the work, I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I'm not saying, and we're, we're far from that, but I would say it's not so much about perfection as it is about authenticity. So what you're really doing when you're wiping away all those old stories, as Cam was saying, or all those wounds and all those insecurities, and you're, you're speaking them to someone that you trust, you know, this can, my friend, Danny, who I mentioned before, played a pivotal role in this for me, because when I met him, I basically met a coach who didn't know he was a coach and I was a coach who didn't know I was a coach. And so when you have two of those types of people meeting, all of your conversations, some of which ran for six hours straight, just Danny and I talking and walking and sharing so much. I didn't realize what we were doing and why it was so powerful. But what we were doing was we were asking each other the right questions about the right old stories and old patterns that were holding each other back. And in, with each passing conversation Danny and I had, we would get lighter and lighter and lighter and our window and our mirror would get clearer and clearer and clearer because all of those old stories were just being wiped away with love, with compassion, and with someone who is trustworthy and very present and who could basically look at you saying the things that you are most insecure about and meet you with love and compassion and non-judgment and just say, you just told me something that's been on your heart for 20 years and I still love you exactly as you are. And you didn't make a mistake and you're perfect. And it really took that container that first Danny set for me and then my friend Talia also set for me to get to a place where we were all helping each other go up and up and up and up and up <laughs> the ladder of freedom, if you will. And then, of course, I get to the point where I was able to meet Cam. And I think that what we really want to underscore here is that if you are someone who really feels naturally drawn towards your own growth, your own freedom. You're someone who looks up um, like how to be a great friend, how to be in a loving relationship, how to find my soulmate from a place of, of accountability, from a place of, I know that I can do something here and that this isn't just going to come find me. I'm willing to put in the work. And that work to get to this point was hard. That was very hard work for me. But you do, in my opinion, the hard work of preparing for a relationship to get to the easy work of being in the right aligned relationship. So the hard work happens in the preparation stage and then you get to the point where you're clear, you're almost like a lighthouse for the love that you want. And then they come and they find you. Exactly. And the whole thing about being clear I believe it is as within, so without. Mm -hmm. So you said, get ready for the right soulmate, the right friend, whatever it may be. We need to ask ourselves, are we being a good friend to ourselves? Mm. And many people, when they hear that question, they're immediately saying, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> because they have that voice of criticism and judgment going on their head 24 seven. This is exactly what we mean by the work. We're here to quiet that voice, to turn it, instead of being the boss or the master, yeah. turning into a loving friend or servant of ourselves. Mm. Because once we can turn that inner voice into one that reciprocates the amount of love that we want to give to the world, then that is when we attract the friends like Danny and Talia, like in my, my opinion, Justin and, and many others that have come into my life. That was only possible through first rewriting those stories in our head. Yes. And in my opinion, how I've been able to do that is through meditation and solitude. Mm. This is the reason why so much of society is distractions because we, we can't sit alone and we can't, um, we're, we're, we're fearful of what's going to come up if we sit in a room alone with our own thoughts and feelings. And so we spend a lot of our lives running away from that. But I feel as if you had this period, or I assume around the same time you met Danny, probably a little bit before, same for myself while living in Bali, I spent a lot of time alone reflecting. And what happens is when you just allow things to be, you just sit in a room alone by yourself, those thoughts and feelings that have been unsettled for probably the majority of your life will come to the surface. And so it's actually incredibly easy. Everything that is the next step of your growth will come to you if you give it the space. And all we did was just give it the space. And when it did come up, we felt through it properly. It was like we're emptying the, dump, the dumpster of, um, you know, 20 year old emotions or whatever they may look like, or two month old emotions, whatever mm -hmm. they may be. And that's what primed us to get to attract people with a similar fog or lack thereof in their mirror, 
just like you did for Danny. Yes. Like I did for Justin and others. And that's when we're able to kind of put the finishing touches or fine tune that mirror to yes. make sure it's really clear for whoever we're ready to attract. Yes. And just to be tactical as well is I had shared a little bit about my journey and it's amazing to even reflect on this. I think one incredible thing about healing is that it's really easy to lose touch with where you began. And so I often remind myself of my former self and hold that version of me with such compassion because just to kind of bring you into who I was before I started doing this work, I was very critical. I had an, a very loud inner critic who was constantly heckling me, almost like a comedian. I mean, honestly, it was pretty funny. I mean, there were times where I'm like, okay, you got a point there. But you have this inner voice in your head that especially around anything to do with performance, whether that's social performance, I'll give you an example right here. As we're sitting in this podcast studio, a former version of me would be terrified to jumble my words or to lose my train of thought or to have a double chin at certain angles or to not look perfect or to have like this this hair out of place that I'm looking at right now. A former version of me would be terrified to be sitting here so much so that she would not be sitting here. So I just want to bring you into the kind of person that I was before I decided that I don't want to be this person anymore. Like there has to be a way of living where I'm not constantly causing my own suffering and constantly beating myself up. And why I share this is because I had such a harsh inner critic and I was so harshly judgmental of myself that what happens is other people feel the judgment that you have towards yourself as if it's directed at them. So have you ever met someone, and this is very common, I would say in like high school girls, you'll see this most commonly here. I think about myself in high school. I send so much love to her because she was really suffering, really in her head, felt like she needed to be perfect, went through all of the struggles and hardships of being a teenage girl. But if you ever talk to someone who's constantly um, fixing their hair or fit constantly almost somewhere else like you're talking to them you're making eye contact and they're like anywhere but there that is because that person is so in their head they're thinking of all the ways that they're being perceived oh do i have something in my teeth they keep looking at my lips like do i have something in my teeth oh my gosh like oh is, am i looking like fat right now or like why is everyone looking at me incredibly self-critical incredibly self-judgmental and terrified of how they're being perceived that was me. So, and I got to a point where I realized I had seen enough patterns in my life. And I think one thing about patterns, if you can really take stock of, let's say the events of the last six months of your life, if you can sit here right now and say, I want more, I'm not where I want to be today, right? As I'm listening to this, I am not the highest version of myself and I am not living a life every day where I jump out of bed like a pop tart and I'm so excited to take on the day. If any of that is true for you, then what I would highly recommend is taking out a journal, looking at the major events that have happened to you, good and bad, over the last six months. And then when you look at the, let's say, bad events. I say bad in air quotes because there are no good or bad events. Everything just is and it's happening in perfect timing. Trust me. <laughs> I know it's hard to see right now, but I promise you, if you look at those those negative events, you are the common denominator in everything that happens to you, good or bad. So if you can look at those events and let's say we'll just take romance. Let's say you've gotten ghosted 10 times or you for some reason can't get past a second date or for some reason you have this amazing chemistry for a week and then the guy completely falls off if you notice any recurring elements to your life that's a pattern that you can closely look at and say the way that i break this pattern that i do not like it's not giving me the results i want it's not making me feel happy or alive is to make a different choice so if you do that exercise, you list out in full honesty and no judgment of yourself, these are the facts of what happened. This is the pattern that I can see these things have in common. And how can I choose differently next time? When the conditions are the same, how can I make a different choice? That's when your life starts to change. And that's exactly the place that I was in when I decided to do the work. I was like, 
I want to find the love of my life. I've been wanting to be, honestly, to be just to be completely honest with you, married since I was like 20. I just love the idea of being with the love of my life. And I was like, I want to have kids and I'm excited to be a mom. And I just love being in partnership with someone and just cuddling and having someone to come home to. Um, not I've never been for the streets. Dating used to terrify me. Uh, those streets don't know me. They don't see me. I wanted to stay far away from them. I was like, where's my <laughs> darling? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no judgment towards anyone in those streets. I mean, he- heck yeah, let's go for it. But I was just somebody who really wanted committed committed love as like soon as I could get it because it brought so much joy to my love, my life. And I'm such a lover girl. So I was in that place and I was like, okay, I keep running into the same patterns in romantic relationships. I'll just go a little deeper on this and then I wanna hear from Cam. But the pattern that I really noticed is that I kept settling. That was my pattern is that, and I'll tell you why, I was very afraid of men. This is the through line. I didn't see this clearly at the time. I see it very clearly now. And this is at the end of doing all the work we mentioned, right? But there was a time where I was very afraid of men. And what this looked like was I had had some experiences in middle school and high school and even college where I had trained myself to be very closed off to strangers, very closed off to men. When men would come approach me in public, my fight or flight would go through the roof. I would feel terrified no matter what that man was, how kind he was, if he was just being a genuine nice guy. I would see a guy coming up to me as like an attack. It was really intense and really scary for me. And every conversation that I had with a strange man in the back of my head was, I just need to leave this interaction alive. So I don't want to upset him. I don't want to not give him my number because maybe he'll hurt me. And that was coursing through my body. And every interaction I'd have with a man was like, they're going to hurt me if I don't play along. So this was people pleasing. This was sacrificing my own desires for men specifically. And what ended up manifesting in my relationships because I was so afraid of men was that the second I found a safe feeling man, I would get into a relationship with him. Even if it wasn't who I was attracted to, even if it wasn't the dynamic that I actually wanted, even if our personalities just didn't really mesh, our hearts didn't speak the same language, I would sacrifice a lot of the things I was looking for because I thought to myself, oh my God, there's no men out there that feel safe to me, that will treat me well. So I'm just going to be in a relationship with this person because I can't have everything I want and I can't have it all. So I'm just going to settle, be in this relationship. And then what do you know? I was in a couple of two-year relationships with people who were objectively not what I wanted. And in a lot of cases were hard for me to be with. These are people, Cam and I were talking about this yesterday. I had one common thread through all my my relationships before Cam. I had to take breaks from the person. If you have to take breaks from the person, I'm not talking about solitude or spending time by yourself. I'm talking about I was not being myself And when you're not being yourself, you get exhausted spending time with your partner because you're performing. You're not being yourself. It's not effortless. It's not easy. There's a level of force and that level of force creates friction. And that only happens when you settle for something that you think you have to be in because you don't think that you can get the relationship that you actually desire and you actually crave. So that's just a little bit about who I was. I was someone who thought men were scary. I was someone who did not believe I could have what I wanted. And I was someone who clung on to men who made me feel safe because I thought they were the only men in the world who could do that. And once I did a bunch of different things over the course of honestly three years, and that's everything from getting more in tune with my body. I did that through meditation. I did that through breath work, which is just a fantastic way to connect to your core. I did that through even just realizing through body scans, which you can do right now by just closing your eyes and drawing your awareness to every part of your body and paying attention to what part of your body feels tense, what part of your body you're constricting. I say this because I used to hold in my stomach all the time, all the time, to look skinnier, to 
shrink myself to because I was almost bracing my stomach for being seen, for being approached. That's what created a lot of the fear in my system. That's a big part of the reason I saw men as threats who were scary rather than really kind men who just thought I was pretty and wanted to get my number. And it's not that big of a deal to say no to. So it's amazing these little methods to get back into the body, how doing that in a concentrated way through having these amazing conversations with my friends, Danny Talia, and so many others along the way, like my friends, Brian and Annie, and I can list off so many names of people who played a part in my journey. But those are just some tactical ways getting into the body especially as a woman. And I feel like we're so disconnected from our bodies in in today's world where we are constantly outside of ourselves. We're constantly on our phones or computers talking to other people. We're externalizing our own self-concept. So the closer you can get back into your body, that's where the work really begins. And it's not easy. You're going to cry a lot. You're going to have a lot of surprise emotions pop up that you can't even anticipate. But after two years of doing that in a really concentrated way, I was able to be in the position to call in this guy right here. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear that. And you part of that resonate with you, my darling? All of it deeply resonate with me, truly. Um, one thing I really want to point out is I believe that the fear that we have in one aspect of life carries over to all aspects of life. And so you talked about the fear you had around men as a whole. Mm-hmm. Of course, our rational mind will believe, all right, more than likely all men aren't bad. It's just a very small subsection that are terrible. Right. But we paint this picture out of safety for our own survival that we're going to bring up those red flags and warning signs whenever we see a man. Yes. And so that's discounting all of the good, kind men out there. That's completely okay. That's literally a safety coping mechanism that we've created in our minds to make sure that there is no chance for danger, especially the same danger that's happened to us in the past. So it makes complete sense while that's there. What it, people that have that current story in their head around men, I want to shine light on the fact that maybe that fear is not only around men. Mm-hmm. It's more than likely dripping into, because it's overflowing in that aspect, it's dripping into other aspects of life. Very true. And so the same women and men, because this is true for every human, when we have an immense amount of fear towards one part of our life, it is affecting every part. And so I assume the same time when you felt most at fear around mm. men is probably the time if you were to do a podcast with another girl on this show. Yeah. So no men in the room, you would still be fearful about how you look, Absolutely. about sucking in the stomach, about the hair, not necessarily that men are watching, but simply because there's a fear for the world as a whole because of this one or small handful of experiences that have happened to us in the past. Yeah. And oftentimes when people are doing that, they're also doing that in their profession too. You're more than likely we're in a misaligned profession because that's what you believed you deserved mm-hmm. as opposed to um, being truly authentic to yourself in all aspects of life to the highest extent. And again, we have full empathy for anyone who's ever had anything happen to them negatively that affects their worldview in a way where they see fear and scarcity over abundance and hope. Um, But we're here through our own personal experiences to realize that we can overcome these mind movies we keep playing over and over again about how the world is, especially if it's painting a very grim picture. What we've had to do through our own experiences is look at the past and look at the people that have harmed us, whether that's physically, sexually, verbally, however that may look, because there's a, a plethora of different avenues of suffering out there. We need to look at all of them and find a way to forgive them. Once any man or any woman has ever hurt you, it is not our fault that it happened, but it is our responsibility to overcome it. And the moment that we can forgive and unconditionally love them, despite how quote unquote terrible they may be, that is the moment we are now free from them. And so I believe this is, of course, why we're here on this planet to learn these lessons. But when someone hurt you when you were seven years old, the hurt didn't stop after they punched you in the face in the, or shoved you in the locker in elementary school, whatever that may look like. The hurting for most people continues for an entire lifetime because we have never been given the tools to overcome it, to let it go, 
And so that suffering, even though the physical wounds and bruises of being shoved in a locker are now over with, they've fully healed, the internal game that we play with ourselves continues on for decades. And of course, this is being shoved in a locker when you're seven years old, or something happened with your father, mother, or a whole country did something to you. Whatever happened, we hold on to it for so incredibly long, and we don't understand that holding on to it is allowing that event or that person to still have power over us. Mm. And so cleaning the mirror is simply taking our power back by letting go and forgiving everyone else who's service in the past. And one big reason why we're, I think, creating this podcast to begin with is we realize that so many people have been hurt through relationships. Yeah. And we are here to to help people understand that to attract anything you want in life, I'm just talking to the men out there because Elle was saying that finding her, her the love of her life has been a dream of her since she was 10 years old, something like of that. Of course. For many men out there, finding the woman may not be the number one thing in the totem pole, what they want to do in life. All of us, I believe, want it to some extent and others, it varies. Mm-hmm. When I found you, that wasn't the number one thing in my life. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm so glad it happened. It happened perfect timing and I was ready, but it was not the number one thing on my agenda. It felt like it kind of plopped into my lap. Yeah. And I feel like that's the case for so many, but I'm here to say no matter what you want in life, it is not an external trek or grind or whatever to get there. It is an internal game. It is a mindset shift that needs to take place to prime us to be ready to attract whoever and whatever we desire. And I feel like whether we knew it or not, it seems like you very much knew it. This is part of the motivation for doing it. Mm. But letting go of everything internally that didn't serve you was priming you to meet me at Lizard Yoga that one President's Day afternoon. (laughs) Yes. And and thankfully for me, it's, it's primed me for to meet you prime me for finally be able to step on camera and not have the deep insecurities, the exact same ones you've had of people pleasing, the laundry list of all the the movies that I used to say in my mind all the time. I had all of them the exact same, but thankfully they've all kind of unfolded at the exact same time to prime myself this higher level of freedom, this higher level of unconditional love for myself and for others that has led to a very quick, Mm. abundant life in all aspects. And so, I think you really have opened up a huge can of worms, but also I believe that the subject that we enjoy the most and that is healing as a whole and the way you've described it currently when it comes to relationships, I think is so important. And I think the main mission why we're here. Yes. And I think what's, what's really interesting about healing in relationships is relationships are your biggest mirror. The person you spend the most time with especially your partner, but even your friends, reveal yourself to you. So you can't heal relationship issues without relationships. And this goes for your relationship with your community, your relationship with yourself, your relationship with another person. It's like in order for me to get past my hardcore scarcity mindset, where I, there was a time where I just did not believe that I would ever find the person. Because I, if you resonate with this, back in 2021, when I saw my patterns and I looked really objectively, and instead of saying, oh, you know, it was this guy who did this and this woman who did this to me and all these people did all these things to me, I just decided to stop and say, what is my role in the situation? Like we were saying before, what it, you are the common denominator in all of your experiences, good and bad. And if you notice a pattern, it's your responsibility to look at it and to also break it and to make different choices in order to break it. So it wasn't until I really had the courage to look at my own contributions to my life to say, I'm going to take a different route. When I'm faced with the same situation, I'm not going to say that thing I'm always, I always say. I'm not going to do that things I, I always do. I am going to choose differently. I'm going to disrupt my own pattern because I want to feel something different. I want something better for myself. It wasn't until I did that when I realized, oh, okay, I am settling in relationships because I'm terrified to date. I'm terrified to date. So me going on one date was so scary that even if I just barely liked the guy, I would be like, you're my boyfriend now. 
Like that's what would ha- literally. I'm not kidding. Like my friends, all one of the memes of my relationships is that I get committed very fast, very very fast, and that's a fear in many different ways. For me, it was a fear of dating. Literally, going on dates was terrifying to me because I was a huge people pleaser. So when I'd go on a date with a guy, and a guy would be like, you know, talking to me for five hours. I'm a really good listener. I'm quite entertaining. Not gonna lie, I'm pretty entertaining. So I'd be on dates and. It would just be an electric conversation for the man. Not really for me, though. Like, this is just a Tuesday for me. But, like, the guy would be like, holy shit, this is the most entertaining, funny, smart, not to gas myself up like that, but, like. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Not my affirmation track, but the guy. Incredibly attractive. <laughs> What? A sex symbol. Oh, oh no, wow. <laughs> Day, you really going for it. But basically, this guy would be smitten with me. And I'm just speaking the truth. Like, this is the truth of my experience. He'd be smitten with me and then basically be like, do you want to be my girlfriend within a week? Like, I'm not kidding. This You can ask any of my close friends who know about my dating stories. When I would go on like a single date, I would basically end up in a relationship. And this was great for me right? Great for me at the time because I didn't want to be going on dates. I was afraid of men. So if I found a man who was like, oh my gosh, you're my wife, I'd be like, I guess I am your wife. Okay. I guess this means I don't have to date all these (laughs) random chads until I choose. What that was though, is it was taking away my own choice and putting the more preference on being chosen rather than me choosing. And what I've come to realize through all the work I've done is that the woman chooses, baby. The man might pursue, and you could have a hundred suitors going for the Helen of Troy, but Helen of Troy chooses the one out of a hundred. And it wasn't until I realized, oh my gosh, why am I being such a pick Misha? I don't need to be a pick Misha. I have so many suitors that like, why am I just going and being the wife of some rando who tells me a couple pretty things after five days? Like, why am I doing this? And it made no sense to me. But it wasn't until I got really honest with myself, saw the patterns in my own dating life, saw the constant settling that I was doing, getting into these like two month, this is what it looked like, be like a two, in some cases, two years, fortunate unfortunate r.i.p lovely guys by the way just not my guy because this is my guy right here but be like two month relationships where i was chosen by a guy who's really really into me and i couldn't be myself because they would almost like mold themselves over what I wanted because it was also really upfront with all the qualities I liked in men. So the men would basically create this beautiful customer service representative that looked exactly like I wanted them to. And then two months in, my mask would slip, their mask would slip, and I'm like, I can't be around this person anymore. So I had that happen so many times. I was like, okay, donezo, can't do this anymore. I've got to interrupt my own pattern if I want to actually have a different experience and call in someone who just feels easy to be around. And I think if you think about relationship philosophies, I'd be curious what you would say about this, but the relationship philosophy that you have shown me is possible is that the love of your life should feel like your best friend and someone who is incredibly easy to be yourself around. And I don't say be yourself in a cheesy way. I mean, like, you can do exactly what you would do if that person wasn't in the room. Yeah. You don't alter your behavior because someone is there. And I had never been in a relationship before you when I can honestly say, I do not alter my behavior at all. Of course, I talk to you and make my little noises and I like stomp around like a gremlin. Which is more the real you. Which is very much the real me. and. All of that comes out with you because you're my person. Exactly. And I think the reason for that is because the mask we wear works both ways. And so when we're wearing a mask, our, the, the eye holes available in that mask are very small. It distorts our vision of reality outside of us. Right. And so when we're wearing the mask, we attract people that are also wearing the same level of a mask. And for many of us, we're wearing an entire costume not just the mask. True. We are a complete different person in public around people we care for or want the acceptance of, rather, that 
we feel we need to take days off from relationship. We need to take days off. We need time away because we can't be our full selves around them. And so if you want people that aren't fake to be around you, identify what parts of your reality, of your persona, of your identity is being fake towards them. Oftentimes we're only showing people 25% of our real selves. Mm -hmm. And it is until we make peace with 100% of our real self that we can show up anywhere, wearing anything, acting any way that feels right to us in any moment, knowing that we don't care what they think because we fully love ourselves. We don't need anything from them. That is when you attract people that really get down with you. Yes. That really like you for you. Yes. And so thankfully, I think you and I have both reached level that if we never found each other, that we'd have to be our 100% selves or just not going to work. Oh, yeah. but Once you feel the freedom of not giving a fuck, <laughs> you can't go back. Right. You just can't. And so- we would not have put up with as many dates. We would not have put up with, with going to these social interactions, the bars, whatever it is that weren't aligned with us because we were not ready or willing to put that mask on again once you've fully taken it off. Yes. And yeah, I think it's just really important that if you want to attract a higher level person, we need to look in the mirror and see, am I still wearing a mask or not? Yes. Am I only showing 25% of me or even 70, 80% of me? What would it look like to operate life in a way where I'm showing 100% of myself to the world? The moment you show 100% of yourself to the world is the moment you will see the world clearly. Mm. And the people who are also showing 100% of themselves, so the real friends, yeah. the ones that you can shoot the shit with and also talk about the deepest things in the world with, yeah. the ones that will congratulate you at your highs and be there for you at your lows, they will come out of the woodwork somehow Yes. And find you. You will attract them and it'll become easy yes. to create your tribe of high quality people. And then inevitably your romantic partner. Exactly. And th that's exactly what happened for us, I believe. I mean, it's it's just amazing to think about how you really do attract what you are, who you are. You don't attract what you want. And I think that's where people get it wrong and that's where i have gotten it wrong in the past is when you don't do the inner work in my opinion you're kind of stuck on this like laundry list of things that you think you want but all of those things you think you want you're thinking in the mind oh this is what i've been told that i want this is the the prince charming the checklist of the height and what they look like and the eye color and they have good family and they have a phd and all these things you tell yourself right that's all coming from the mind but when you don't get in touch with yourself, you don't actually know what you want. You don't even really know what it feels like. So I think after I had gotten really in touch with my body again, I was like horribly disassociated. I was so overheating in the mind. I was such an overthinker. Um, that's where a lot of my suffering came from is I was just constantly in the mind. I had no connection to my body. I was like a walking brain pretty much. <laughs> that was like constantly about to topple over because I was thinking too much. And when I got reconnected with my body, that's when it became incredibly clear to me that the woman chooses. It's like, oh, I don't have to just be terrified going out on dates and letting myself be chosen by whoever wants me. It's like, no, wait, hold on. I, I have a lot to offer. I have a hot ticket here. And if I'm connected to my body, I can say... It doesn't matter if someone wants me because there are millions of men who would want me. You have to have that mindset in order to be the chooser as a woman. But if you are st stuck in scarcity telling yourself, oh my gosh, I might never find someone better than this. Oh my gosh, like what if I mess this up? Oh my gosh, this is such a good guy. Oh my gosh, I will never have an opportunity like this again. That's when you tell yourself all these stories, you don't want to mess it up. You actually choose someone who's not right for you. That's what I kept doing. So I was so afraid to actually say no because saying no would like make this one guy fall away. But when that one guy falls away, you create space for what you actually desire, what you actually want. But when you're in the mind, when you're overthinking and you're completely disconnected from the body, you don't have as much in tune connection with your desires, with what you want. So I just wanted to share that because I feel like that was exactly the place I was in when we met. Yeah, it makes complete sense. I think for all men or women, it's very important to do two things simultaneously if you want to heal and grow and then inevitably track the person that you're meant to live with. And that is let go 
of the limiting beliefs we have around everything, but especially relationships, yeah. while simultaneously incrementally building ourselves into the person that is capable of attracting our dream partner. Mm. This is one thing that I think society as a whole loves to look over because everyone wants change, but no one wants to change. Mm -hmm. We oftentimes, especially as men, and I'm, I'm talking to men almost fully in particular here, we have we get very clear on the list <laughs> of of what we want in a woman, right? How we want them to act, how how we want them to look, every part of them. So we got the the visualization part down. The one part we don't have down is what does that version, what does that vision want from me? What do they mm. want from their male partner? Yeah. And then like, oh, I don't want to look at that. <laughs> because you realize the list you've created, that list, that human avatar, whatever they may look like, is going to want someone much different than what we currently are. Right. And that gap is the hardest part and to look at. That's the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> that's the mirror. I'm not saying everyone needs to be perfect in all ways, but what I am saying is that there's not a single person in this world that wants to marry someone that holds an immense amount of judgment, resentment, fear, hatred towards themselves or towards the world. We can all learn to love more, have more compassion, take better care of ourselves, our bodies, our minds, and therefore the people around us. Um, and so I think it's just incredibly important. But one thing you said about women holding the power that I really want to touch on too, I deeply believe that to be true if women number one chose to operate at a higher standard which is you know hard for me to say as a man but if chose to operate from a higher standard and then operating from that higher standard demanded more from men men will reach those demands mm -hmm. men will only operate at the level in which they get away with <laughs> so if you want all these these things in a man, but you still keep on going after the guys that are deadbeats, don't have a job, they're, you know, don't have a future in mind, that whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you keep allowing that behavior, if you keep allowing a connection with them, as a society, those men are going to continue. Yeah. If we want men and therefore humanity to progress, we need to increase the standards we have for first ourselves and then for others. So as a woman, I'm not a woman, but as a woman, if you are able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am a loving person, I will be a fantastic wife one day, a fantastic mother one day, I take care of myself, I love myself, I love others. That is a woman that is priming herself to attract a man that has those same attributes. Mm -hmm. on the masculine side. It is the dissonance that's taking place as opposed to what we believe we're, we want or need as opposed to what we actually deserve. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that caused so much friction. This is why I see a lot of people in society where it's like, I just don't understand why this doesn't happen. I just don't get why I don't have this. I don't get why men don't find me attractive or women don't find me attractive. I don't get why this is not. All those I don't get statements come from that dissonance as opposed to where you actually are to where the person or opportunity you want requires you to be. So I thought I'd just add that in. <laughs> I love that. Oh my <laughs> gosh, it's so true. And I think one thing about the woman's experience that I'll just touch on, because a lot of my personal journey that I didn't share, I know you shared your job and being a mis misaligned job. So for some background, I've always been a very high achieving woman. I've always been very powerful. Um, I've always been smart. So just to give you a sense, like I've been competitive. Yeah, thank you. I've been very competitive since I was like a little girl. I was like constantly winning writing competitions. I had like the highest grades in all of my classes. I was a huge achiever and high performer all the way through college. Graduated with a four point or four point, a 3.96, uh, graduated summa cum laude, uh, got my first job at Facebook. Even though I studied journalism and marketing in college, I had no idea what tech was. I thought Facebook was powered by Mark Zuckerberg and on a bike in his basement. I mean, I literally did not know anything about tech. And I get my first job in tech. I worked in tech for seven years until about a month ago, Cam retired me. So I love retiring to my 24-year-old husband. Mm. But I just share this back. <laughs> I just share this background because if you're wondering like who am I 
I was someone who was like very high achieving, won many awards, was this, that's who I am. But what I realized was I have always wanted a relationship dynamic where I didn't have to be the one leading the relationship. Like I did not want to be the high achieving person I was in work in love. In fact, I wanted it to be the opposite. I wanted a break. (laughs) I wanted to just be myself and be valuable, not for what I was doing and accomplishing, but but to be valuable for the energy that I was bringing and the love that I was bringing to the space and to my man. And I've always known that deeply. I've always also known that I wanted to be a mother. I didn't want to have a traditional career. I worked a very high-powered job to take care of myself until I found my man, basically. And it was like my ideal situation would be that I am not working a traditional career, that I have the space to be myself and tap into all of the amazing missions that I care about. Um, You may know, if you know anything about me, I host an event every single week. I've now hosted 110 of these, a five-mile walk every Saturday. Saturday at 8 a.m. called The Boardwalks, hosted 110 in a row, and I absolutely love it, but that's community building, and I do it for free, so I'm not making money there. That's not my job. We also host, Cam and I, uh, a gratitude party every weekday at 8 a.m. called Great Morning, and that's so exciting. I just share this because what really lights me up was not my job at Facebook, which is why I'm not working there anymore. I don't get me wrong, lots of lessons, lots of love. I'm so forever grateful for Facebook for giving me the resources in order to not have to work. So thank you. But where I am right now, what's way more exciting to me is connecting with people and creating experiences where people feel more love and more connection in their lives. And the real dynamic that I wanted, the dream dynamic for my life is the life I'm living right now with Cam. And because of Cam, in a lot of ways. So I just wanted to share a little bit about our relationship dynamic. Like Cam is a man, baby. He ain't a boy. He a man. And he is a provider. And he is going to be the most amazing father. He is the most loving man who really, like, I kid you not, if you just shouted us wherever we went, he opens all the doors for me. The other day, I had to open the door by myself because he was dropping me off to go to a restaurant. And I, like, forgot how to open the door. Like, that's how I'm, I was like, damn, this door is heavy. I'm like, wait, what's happening? So, like, just to go show you, like, I do very little. In our dynamic, Cam creates like the most amazing environment for me to thrive and to just be my wacky self. And a lot of people would look at our dynamic and be like, well, what's the woman doing in this dynamic? And I'll let Cam answer that. <laughs> and the answer to that is exactly nothing. The woman does nothing. And now, oh, I know how that sounds. And this isn't the 1800s or 1950s, whatever it is. What I'm trying to say, I, I, we need to really redefine this because this is, again, a dynamic that works really well for us. And I think would actually, um, if people felt this would work right for them, Um, but not everyone, this is not for everyone, but this is something that's worked very well for us. And when I say the woman does nothing, you need to be very, very clear. The doing part, or at least how I define doing is oftentimes acting upon something that you rather would not. And so working a job at Facebook um, paid you incredibly well, gave you status, but also, after you you listed all your gifts and I added a few attributes that you have, it's became clear to you over the past handful of years. And it's very clear to me as soon as I met you that the impact you can make on the world, if continuing to work at Facebook would hinder it. You have the potential, if you wanted to, become the next Oprah Winfrey or you know, expand the walks to be huge, expand everything else you're doing to be huge. And you spending 40 plus hours a week working for Facebook, managing products, I don't believe was really fulfilling out that highest level of good you can have on the world. And again, this isn't, it, I don't really care what she, she's doing as long as it's happy, as long as it's exciting. And so if she was completely content in Facebook, work there the rest of your life, really don't care. But I think as a man, one of the greatest things I can do, one of the greatest motivators is to allow or give the gift of freedom and abundance to my woman and the person who's going to be um, creating our family in the distant future. I want her to wake up every day with excitement, not like, oh, I have to go to work today, I have to check in, I have to log in. No, no, I want everything she does to be, 
building towards the highest good of herself, of our family, and the world around us. And so I like to say you do nothing, but you are <laughs> being all the time, right? <laughs> do nothing. You, you do so much, but it's not in the normal way of doing, it's, it's being. And so naturally, you are just so great. You are such in your element when you are leading and hosting the walks. It's like you're floating around, you're flowing. <laughs> it's like you're in a different reality and we're just here to witness it. And and you do so with so many other creative projects, whether it's your, your writing online, speaking online, um, great mornings, it all just flows naturally through you. And we can't describe that with the same words that we described your output or you're doing at Facebook or whatever job or whatever thing you had, project you had before then. They are very two different ways of you existing and creating. And so I am here as a man, and I believe many men would receive so much fulfillment if they worked to the point in which they can give their wife, their family, their extended family, that exact same gift. Mm. To give them the freedom to wake up every day and do or be whoever they feel is right in that moment. And that's something that I feel as if I'm very grateful to unlocked a new level of L, a new level of happiness. Like we, we can feel it in your voice. When you're talking about the Facebook job and you'll zuck on the bike in his basement. <laughs> as opposed to talking about the project, we can feel the excitement and the smiling flowing through you because it's the difference between passionless and incredibly passionate. And I want to do everything that makes you incredibly passionate. And uh, it has just unlocked a new level for relationship, knowing that you can fully step into the highest version of yourself, knowing that myself is pretty much a safety net, got you no matter what. And uh, I think my greatest gift I can give the world is giving you the gift of unlocking everything that you're capable of. And um, it's funny, me giving someone else that gift through um, financial support, but also emotional support is the greatest motivator for me to unlock everything I need. So again, humans were naturally selfish. She talked a little bit about her schooling history. I had a relatively similar effect. I was not the 3.98, whatever it was. <laughs> I was not all that. I did not graduate top of class, whatever it was. I understood ever since early on in elementary school, that the far majority of what we're being taught is absolute bullshit. And that we are being taught to be employees. We were taught from the same system that was destined to create factory workers. And I knew that that was not my destiny. And so I operated school as if I was an entrepreneur. Other than working as hard as I can, I befriended the professor. I befriended the- the. the I wish the I smart, did that. The, the smartest <laughs> kids in class. And, and naturally through proximity, I was able to just do better than I naturally would have if I relied on my own merit. If they, if I stayed in that little box of everything being an individualistic thing, like um, school and, and universities try to make you do. And so I was able to really float my way through it, no problem. Um, and by no means would I say I worked incredibly hard in formal schooling um, and because I didn't really feel like it was necessary. There's nothing really for me to learn in that way. But when it came to the real world and real jobs, I, I, work, I can work immensely hard and have in the past. Um, in the past, they've been towards a lot of unaligned things. So they've mm. given me the societal benefits that we all want of the money and the admiration, but none of the um, benefits or true heart wants. And so now that I've really understood the difference between the two, I can go into what my heart truly wants. And naturally, funny enough, when you double down on what your heart truly wants, everything else just kind of takes care of itself. Mm. And so me realizing, seeing all these needs in society, seeing the amount of suffering currently taking place, especially amongst my generation, and building businesses, communities, projects, and systems around helping them solve that has led to so much, not only abundance financially, but also an abundance of joy, an abundance of bliss, an abundance of excitement to wake up to every single day. But I'm still human. There are some days where I just want to do absolutely nothing and not go on the calls, not do the emails, and sometimes I do that. But the far majority of the days, I make sure I get up and do what needs to be done because I know I have people relying on me. Mm. 
hmm. because I know me putting in this work. Thankfully, it's all fully line work now. It was in the past. So I myself enjoy it and, and find it exciting. Um, but mm -hmm. I know many men out there aren't currently in that position yet. But they'll tell you, it's worth it knowing that their wife, their kids, whoever it may be, are able to live their best life. Yeah. And so that, that gets me out of bed every single morning. And um, I think that's happened because you set such a high standard for yourself months ago, years ago, and you attracted out of the millions of men that would be pursuing it. I think <laughs> probably billions to be honest. But, but I think very highly of you, of course. I love you. Um, you nearly chose me because you see I was, I was worth or, or capable of the task. Yeah. Um, because the high standards you set. And so. It's so easy. It's, uh, it's quite amazing. And I really think it's important for us to kind of distill back to one thing is that the common denominator amongst all of our problems and all of our solutions have always been ourselves. Mm. And so if we see a pattern take place of, um, we keep attracting the same type of women that we would rather not have, the same type of man rather not have, or same type of business opportunities, jobs, or whatever else it may be, what is a common denominator in that? Mm -hmm. And it's always ourselves. And so when we realize that, we can then from that point decide to rewrite the story and therefore rewrite the actions, habits that we are doing to put ourselves in a better position that is aligned to the highest version of ourselves. And that's how real change is made. I love that, baby. It's almost like as you were talking, I was thinking about how if everybody listening to this just took out a fresh page of their journal and said, I am the main character of my life and I am going to write the best next season of my life possible. And you were just a journal about, like, let's date it a year from now. So September 2nd, 2025. And you write everything in past tense as if your perfect year from now until then happened. What would it say? And if you take all the actions to bring that perfect year into reality, including finding the love of your life, including finding that job or career situation that makes you jump out of bed, including all those fun projects you've always wanted to start, but you've just kept avoiding. If you write all of it out, and then commit to taking an action, maybe every day, one small habit every day towards that reality, it will happen. Like, I promise you. The other day, Cam and I, we recently moved into our house, and it's just the cutest, most adorable house, and we're going to decorate it, and you'll probably be seeing us uh, report live from that house soon. But I found in the drawer of my desk this exact thing that I'm telling you to do right now, this future set letter where I wrote to uh, myself, okay, this is August of 2024, and these are all the things that happened to me. And guess what? Almost all of them came true. One of the ones that did not happen over that year was starting a podcast. And look where we are, are now. Are you serious? Yeah. That's the one thing on that list. And just to be specific, and I can even post a picture of this, what was on this list was me winning Forbes 30 under 30, which I did. Me finding the love of my life, which I did. Me buying a house, which I did. Literally everything that I wrote. Um, The boardwalks expanding to multiple cities. The boardwalks are in Austin and San Francisco. And at the push of a button could be in a hundred more cities if I wanted to. That will come soon. <laughs> That's a different story, different podcast. That's a different story, way different story, different podcast. Um, Finding the most amazing soul aligned friends that has happened building a community that has grown internationally that's happened twice with both the walks and great mornings which we started 15 days ago so all i'm saying is this works but the only way that it worked was because i was willing to do everything that we've been talking about to know that i'm the main character of my life i am the creator of my reality i create every moment and every experience good or bad whether or not I have a good day or a bad day or a good moment or a bad moment is me. It's up to me. And I'm in complete control. And if you can put the yourself in the driver's seat of your own life and then do this journaling exercise and then commit to taking one small action or one small habit every day towards getting there, you will get there. Like I am a living proof of the fact that we are here. And I'm crossing off the very last thing off that list starting a podcast right here in this moment. Congratulations. And, which is amazing. So that one did not happen in the year, but everything else happened in the year. And right. I promise you the biggest mindset shift was that you were the creator of your own reality. And then 
everything unfolds and flows from there. But I think it might be time to tell everyone about how after all of this work we talked about and all of these little gems of knowledge that we've dropped so far, after we did all of these things, that fateful day in February 2024, you want to tell them? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So February 2024, I had just moved to Austin a little over a month ago. And I, again, moved here without knowing a single person, never been here before. And I had a list of attributes I wanted in an apartment. And uh, I typed it in apartments.com the night I drove here, I stayed in Airbnb for a few nights, the night I drove here. And the first apartment to pop up, I'm like, that's the one. Went in toward it the next day, it was perfect. I'm like, perfect, moving in, moving in the day after that. Everything happened incredibly fast. This is all January of 2024. And then a few days later, I'm just walking around the area of that new apartment complex just to see everything that's around. And I stumbled upon this place called Lizard Yoga breathwork meditation, yoga, sauna, cold plunge, which I love. Everything else I got there is just truly incredible. And so I started to frequent that quite a bit, bought a membership that day, like this is gonna be the place. And then um, about a month later, I had a very busy day. I was writing quite a bit in the morning, but I had this gut impulse that I needed to schedule a sauna session and just go. I remember it was a holiday, I think it was President's Day. President's Day, it was um, a Monday. It was, for, it was supposed to be at 4 p.m. I never go at 4 p.m. I was like, I need to be here today. I don't know why, but I do. And so it's right up the street. So I just walked there and around 3.52, I decided to go into the little meditation room, little waiting room they have there, um, just to relax before my session started. And some across this long, blonde, beautiful haired, beautiful human being um, sitting in the, in the corner couch, obviously writing something and there's a voice, like oftentimes I'll go up and, and say something to to random people, especially cute girls or whatever it may be. But <laughs> in particular, this I felt something, different energy. I'm like, I really need to do it this time. And so I think I started with just like, hi, uh, I'm Cameron. What's your name? Nice to meet you, Elle. And then you kind of quickly dismissed it and went back to, back to writing. And so I'm like, all right, yeah, no problem, no problem. So I go into down on the couch, probably five, six feet away. You gotta say something again. The voices in my head are like, say something, say something. All right, whatever. So I'm over here like, what you, what you writing? <laughs> and then you can take it from there. So this was so wild. This was President's Day and I was still at my job at Facebook. So I actually had this day off, but I would never be at Lizard Yoga on a Monday, just so that you know. This was very like bizarre that this even happened. So when Cam started talking to me, I was in the middle of writing a story based on something that uh, one of our dear friends, we have these uh, two friends who are identical twins, the Tuckers, shout out Cole and Ian if you're out here listening. And one of the twins said something to me that made me just laugh. And I usually write stories around quotes that people say. They were like, you know, there's something about you and Danny, one of my best friends, Danny Miranda, where as soon as I start talking to you, I just want to word vomit the truth and it just comes out. I just thought that was the most amazing quote. So I was writing a story around that quote and around how strangers always come up and talk to me. And literally, as I'm writing this, I even took a screenshot of where I left off on that story in my notes app because I was like, what are the odds that I was writing this thing about how strangers always talk to me when this stranger right here came up and talked to me? So when Cam started talking to me, I was so in the zone of my story that I just kind of blew him off a little bit, which is not uncommon for me because I get very focused and I love to write. So once he re-engaged and was like, what you writing over there? Like, I'm actually a writer too. I was like, okay, you know, I'm like, okay, he handsome. I'm going to bite and see what he has from me. Let's see what this guy got. So then we started talking and he was like, oh, what are you writing? And I told them what I just told you about the Tuckers and this quote and the walks that I host. And Cam goes, oh, are those the walks on Saturday mornings? I know about those through Danny Miranda's podcast. And I was like, Danny Miranda? That's my best friend. Like, what are the odds that you'd find out about this on his podcast? He's like, yeah, your Danny Miranda's podcast is a, is a big reason I moved to Austin from Bali. Like, what are the odds of that? So at that point, I heard a voice come down very clearly and say, put the phone down, 
stop writing this story and talk to this man. He is very important. And whenever I get that voice, it truly feels like nothing else exists. And I'm just fully there with that person for as long as it takes. So from that moment on, Cam and I talked in this little meditation room just to set the scene. It's this beautiful, oh, the most golden glow room with Himalayan salt lamps lining an entire wall. And so it's this beautiful peach glow on our faces and the most cozy little room that people are walking in and out of. And many people walked in, felt the vibes, and they walked right out because they were like, I don't know what's going on in there, but I feel like I'm interrupting something just to kind of show you what was going on there. So we then had a three hour conversation. And in that conversation, I'm curious what you remember about it. Of course, I have. I remember. Yeah. I I know exactly what we talked about. But what do you remember? I am a story. I just remember you being very attractive. (laughs) And then you came with so much enthusiasm as you moved from one couch to my couch. And I was like, oh. My first thought was, I'm not making it to my sauna session. And so, <laughs> is. And so you know, we ended up talking for what, three and a half hours? Three and a half hours, and half yeah. Hours. So you miss your class, I miss mine. And I noticed immediately the immense amount of eye contact that you have. And yeah. you feel just so fully present. Just like the talk was saying, how the truth just spills out of someone. That is something that I always felt as if I've had. Because I've just had random people come up to me and tell me their deepest, darkest secrets without me prompting it or anything. and I've never really saw any other person until I met you Mm. and everything just flowed and you know there's a lot of my mind just moved from across the world back to America and didn't know anyone yet really in in Austin and um, you just kind of sat there and listened and we're able to not only listen but it was an equal exchange of of talking because there were so many ideas in my mind about life and human nature as a whole and for some reason it just felt as if you knew those answers And so we were able to just have this incredible conversation, mostly around a lot of spiritual things that have been happening to me recently. And you Mm. shared with me the map of consciousness and uh, that book completely changed my world. But just the the idea of of putting numbers and names of emotions around everything I've been feeling felt out of this world and felt so profound. And despite or besides ending up marrying the woman I was having that conversation with, there was, even if there was no romantic connection, that still would have been one of the most profound conversations of my life. Like we really went down a rabbit hole amongst all of the deepest conversations and stories that I wish I could have shared, but I just couldn't with the people around me. Yeah, It was like, finally someone in my life I can feel seen by, fully seen by. And I even told you that. You did. Like, I feel maybe the most seen by you than ever, anyone ever before. And um, it was just such a, a deep, deep human to human connection at that point. And I was just, I was so happy. And it just, that one conversation just deeply changed my life. And um, we, of course, the things that happened after that day, but that day in particular was just so, so, so impactful because I finally felt as if I'm not alone. I feel as if when we are on this journey of rapid improvement, oftentimes it feels as if we must leave one environment to then hopefully be met with a better environment that suits our current reality, that um, is aligned to the highest version of ourselves. And that was a period of my life where I physically left, but also emotionally was no longer in relationships, whether romantic relationships or friendships or just everything around me, literally the geographical location of which I was living, everything was completely changed. And to have a spark of light, that there's hope, that there are people like this out here that made me feel as if I'm not alone was so, so, so powerful for me. It's amazing how you were kind of in this stage of the journey where you are learning all these things and talking about all these things and your mind are are full of these ideas that like no one really cares about. Yeah. And it's almost like, oh, well, I'm just going to, I remember you told me in that conversation, you were like, I've been 
having so many new ideas and thoughts and ways of living come into my mind, but I feel like no one around me is matching those. So how am I supposed to make friends? I feel very lonely. I don't feel like there are people around me that I can even have a conversation with that interest me. So you were very much in a stage. I remember you specifically saying, I typically go on dating apps to make friends. Yeah. And I feel myself not wanting to do that anymore, but I don't know what to do outside of that. That's all I I know. This is what I know from the past. I don't want to download those again and then try to find friends. I don't want to go to random happy hours and bars and meetups in order to try to find friends. I want to hopefully find people who are thinking about the same things that I'm thinking about so I don't have to compromise this new version of me because I have a limiting belief that there are nobody out there like me. There's no one out here thinking like me, feeling like me, wanting to be where I want to be. And then when we met, there was something really special that happened on both ends. But I think that because I had had people in my life who had given me that same gift that I had given you, thankfully, of being seen and understood, where it was no longer like you had to hide a part of yourself in order to fit in. You had to hide a part of yourself to belong or to get through the conversation or just lower yourself in what you were thinking about in order to match the environment. It was this profound moment of, wow, this person I'm talking to has thought these same things. We are speaking the same language. And I think that ease and that like lack of friction and lack of force was startling in that conversation. Because I just remember thinking to myself, I mean, you were so curious. You were asking such amazing questions. And that is such a rare quality. And especially men. To just be absorbing and so present and so locked in to what's being said, but also able to process it and then give you something back. Then you have all these like ideas floating around. You and I talked for so long and I was sharing my journey with you that, like I mentioned earlier in this pod, all of the things I struggled with from the boundaries to people pleasing to perfectionism to putting on a mask. I'd been accused for many years of being fake because people couldn't relate to how like happy and joyous I was. I'm very high energy and they thought that I'd like go home and basically just collapse because it has to be some act. Cam has gotten a lot of those same accusations, if you want to call it that. People have said the same things about Cam. And when I met him, I was like, oh my gosh, like there's another alien just like me. That's literally how it feels. I feel like what was happening there was I was at the point in my life where I made the commitment, I'm going to fully take off the mask, mm. but I hadn't yet found other people that had their mask taken off. Yeah. And so that's a very lonely just time. So me wanting to be like, man, should I start drinking again? Just even though it's partially me putting back on the mask, but that's the only way I know how to be around people. Then I go to bars and meet people that way, whatever it is. Um, and so I was contemplating putting back on the mask and what you did was hold my hand and be like you can live this authentic way and you will attract the people that you're meant to be around yeah. people that are fully aligned and you were just that first person for me thankfully and um but it's hard to continue to go against the norm when you have no proof that there are people out there exactly like you i think it's an incredibly brave thing is like to to survive through the gap of the growing pains of like i'm leaving my old self behind and i'm stepping into a new version of myself a lot of people from your past will see you as unrecognizable and the people in your life really want to keep you safe rather than to help you grow so when you make the decision that i want to be a different person i want to step into another reality a lot of the times what you've known and the people who you've known and the conversations you've had they will all change and it's a very lonely period when you commit to being a different version of yourself. You commit in all ways. You Now you're in a different environment. You got different friends. You got a different loved one. You got different mission. You got different habits in your day. And from that place, if you just hold on to that place and trust that you will call in people who are at that same place, it can it will happen, but it can be incredibly scary when you don't see proof of it. And so one thing that I will say, if this resonates and you feel like you're in that gap right now, is first, keep the faith because those people are there. Funny enough, I've talked about this before. When I was in that gap, Danny, one of my best friends, kept bumping into me 
unplanned on the trail in Austin, Texas. We bumped into each other six times unplanned until we were like, okay, we need to be friends clearly. And now he's one of my best friends. So if you just keep the faith and do not allow yourself to be brought back into these environments and no longer serve you around people who no longer serve you. If you commit to stepping into the higher, higher version of yourself, you will see that reality change slowly if you just trust and believe that it will. But if you're looking for people in that energy, um, if we resonate with you at all, then I just want to extend a quick please welcome an invitation to the great morning meeting that we host. We do gratitude affirmations and one accountability for a high vibe habit every single weekday. And I only share this because I've been so lit up like a Christmas tree over the stories that people in our group are sharing who are in this exact place that we're talking about, this gap where they're like, I want more for myself, but my environment is not showing me it's possible. It is possible. And if you don't join our group, if we don't resonate, then like, just please trust and believe that you will find the thing that resonates with you. Don't go backwards. Keep moving forwards and trust that it will, it'll come in. It'll flow in perfectly at the perfect time. You know, I had this exact same conversation in the client's mind. And how that works is it feels as if the far majority of our life, we've been stuck in this room, very dark room. Everyone feels like they kind of get their eyes closed, whatever it is. And we realize that there's something inside of us like, I don't need to be in this room anymore. And so what we do is we start opening a door and going down a very slim, dark hallway. We don't know how long that hallway is going to be, but we know that we're going to have to walk it alone. Mm. With the idea, with the hope that the end at the, at the end of the hallway, there will be a bigger, lighter, brighter room. Yeah. And so a lot of people are either contemplating walking down that hallway or are currently in that hallway and like, how much longer do we need to go until I reach that other room? It's being way too long. I'm thinking about just heading back. And um, we are here, I believe, on the other side of that hallway. Yeah. In that bigger room, or if you want to just call it outside in the world, in nature, we went from our eyes being closed to our eyes being squinted to our eyes being fully open that we now guide people who us, whose eyes are squinted mm -hmm. to fully open their eyes and guide them into the bigger room into the world as we know it, this heaven, this place can be. And so I, I absolutely love what you're saying, baby. I think that's 100% spot on. And that is such an important part of life to double down on that gut feeling that we have, mm. that we deserve better, that this may not be right, how it currently is. There is something more out there for me. And I'd say the number one sentence or question to summarize my late 20s and then oh sorry i'm not late 20s late i'm still 24, 24. late teens <laughs> early 20s is the question is there more mm. and just really seeing that through has been the greatest journey of my life and seeing that through the inner work that takes place to see that through lies everything you've ever wanted through romantic relationships, through opportunities, through abundance, through love, compassion, through this place feeling a lot more like a heaven on earth as opposed to a hell on earth. And um, yeah, back to what we said, we create things that help people or guide people through that process, including great morning. And show them and prove to them that you're not alone. I think that's one of the hardest parts is doing this by yourself and just being like, oh, one day they're going to come and I'm going to find my soul tribe. I'm going to find my people. I'm going to find my person. And it's hard to keep the faith and keep hope without slipping into old patterns. Like what Cam was sharing with me in that conversation that it stuck with me so much. I, I bring it up quite often, actually, is this idea where, you know, he was almost exasperated in our first conversation saying, I, I don't I don't want to go back on the dating apps. I don't want to do what I've always done. And if you feel like you're in that place, I just, the one thing that I want to impart is you will see your reality shift if you commit to it. If you commit to saying, I'm a different person, I want different things, I want different people around me, I want different conversations, I want different ideas in my head, I want different feelings. If you commit to that and you do not go backwards, it will happen. And if we resonate, 
come on down. We welcome everybody who's curious, kind, and open-minded with an open heart and open minds. But I just wanted to share that because I think I could not have prepared myself for our relationship without the conversations around my old wounds, my pain, my insecurities that I had with people who made me feel truly seen and truly understood. And I think some of the last pieces of work that you had to do in order to create our relationship was to be seen by me, funny enough. So going back to our story, which is really wonderful, and like I wouldn't change one detail of our story. Cam and I met President's Day of 2024. So just a couple of like six months ago, basically. And that day we had exchanged numbers. I had told Cam, listen, my friend Danny, he's hosting a retreat and you've got to be there. And I'm thinking there's a low slim chance of this young buck, this 24 year old having a, a young 3K to drop on this retreat wrong. He immediately paid the stripe blank. He was like, I'll be there. I had Danny like swap around some beds. I think he slept on the floor to allow Cam to come. Something just told me he had to be there. And we had swapped. Um, you gave me like a breath work that you really enjoyed. And we he, he remembered all the different things. He was like, what's that book you told me about? And I sent him the map of consciousness explained, which was what a romantic conversation to talk about consciousness. And all of these things happened. And when I got home, he texted me, I think our conversation changed my life. I think you changed my life today. And I was just like, wow. And like, little did I know where this was going to turn into. But for that rest of the week, Cam ended up talking to Danny, getting accepted to the retreat, going on the retreat. And then the next day, literally the day after the retreat, Danny texted me and he's like, hey, let's go to dinner so that I can tell you all about my retreat so I don't forget any of the details because I am the historian of my friend group and Danny does not have the best memory as of right now. I'm going to speak into existence. He's going to work on that. It's going to happen. But we sit down at the Hyatt Hotel here in Austin, the outdoor area overlooking the beautiful Ladybird Lake. And three minutes in, because I record all of my conversations with Danny, three minutes into the recording, you hear Danny? L and it's Cam and Cold Tucker, who I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, believe it or not, walking together, see me and Danny eating dinner. And me and Danny are like, you gotta be kidding me, because Cam and Cole had both been on the retreat that Danny was about to debrief me on. So we're like, come on up here, guys. They come on up. We end up pulling up two chairs and we end up having a conversation that I can only describe as proof that miracles exist for six hours. This is recorded on my phone. We call it the Holy Hyatt Burger because that's what Danny gets every time he goes to the Hyatt. And in that conversation, about 10, 15 minutes in, there's a moment where we're all buzzing on an absolute high of first of all, just life in general, but second of all, this retreat that Cam, Cole, and Danny had been on. And Cam is saying something about the retreat and he's looking at me and you want to tell them what happened? I just looked into her eyes and this never happened to me before for anyone, but I just looked into her eyes and all the words I was meant to say next just completely fleeted from my mind and heart and it just, well, I was a loss for words. And I just looked at her just like this. I think like I grabbed like your thigh or hand yeah, or something. You did. And I'm just like, I love you. <laughs> and you did exactly that. I did. And, and that too. Uh -huh. And and I think you said like, oh, I love you too. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I love you. And we just kind of held that for, <laughs> for long 45 time. seconds. Like, no, it was minutes. 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 It was like five minutes. And okay. I don't know what Danny and Cole were thinking, but yeah, they were there. I didn't know what that was either. Like, <laughs> of course, when you think that, I'm like, oh, he's talking about romantically. I, it didn't even feel that way in that moment. It was just overwhelming. It was just so overwhelming. Even now, thinking about it, it just felt like. I knew that you'd be in my life for the rest of my life. Like immediately. 
I didn't know at what level what that meant, but I'm like, this is either gonna be a very close friend or something else, we'll see. And then, yeah, we, we had that moment and then progressed throughout the night. And I mean, six hours long, we had so many different discoveries. And I talked about on the retreat how I realized that oftentimes we withhold love from ourselves because that's what we felt as if we need to do as a child. And so we felt as if we need to be a certain way, we need to be perfect, we need to do our hair a certain way, we need to look a certain way, we need to get certain grades, we need to get a certain job, whatever else it may be, we need to marry a certain person. We, we create these stories in our head based off of the, the love we feel as if we're not being given, especially as a child. This can happen in teenage years, 20s, 30s, your entire life, but especially as a child, it's an important time. And I realized at the retreat, and I said it, I said it while, um, while at dinner, was that I realized that I create a story in my head that my mother and father, my father in particular, did not love me unconditionally. Mm. And that a lot of what I did in my life was to hopefully get his acceptance and approval. What I then realized was that was just a story I was telling myself. That I created a story that they did not love me unconditionally to let myself suffer and be okay with that. And um, I realized that night that like, a lot of people in your life love you unconditionally and we, are, we don't have the lens or the eyes to see it. And the way they're doing it may not be in the way that we think it should be. And so, as I'm explaining that, which was for me a huge development because I felt as if I'd overcame a lot of insecurities and a lot of my own inner suffering at that point and just really getting to the root of why that first started was huge. But the moment I, I share with y'all, I get a text like a long paragraph from my father, long story short, telling me that he usually loves me. And it was just like, what? It was so wild. And then the same thing happened to Cole Tucker. Mm -hmm. A very similar story that, that many, many of us have around our parents, our extended family, around everyone who's ever had um, responsibility over us as a child. And he had a very similar experience. Danny talked about his very similar experience. And it was just like this great kind of kumbaya, kumbaya type dinner um, where we had just so many mini synchronicities mm. and what felt like kind of miracles happen together. And then now knowing I met my future wife that night, like, or not met, but told her I loved her. Yeah. It was kind of the icing on the cake, the whole thing. And you know what was funny is like, <laughs> in, because I we had prepared each other, each other, well, somewhat, we'd prepared for each other. A lot of what happened between Cam and I and the effortless flow of like, I don't know what this is. He doesn't know what this is, but we just love spending time together because I had prepared myself to be comfortable in the unknown with men, which was something I was deathly afraid of. What a past version of myself who I hold with love would have done would, would have been like, are you in or are you out? You know, are, do you, are you into me? Are you out of me? You'd let me know because whatever it is, I'm either here or I'm out of here. And I used to be very cutthroat uh, right before I met Cam. Not not the entire of my relationship history, but honestly, right before I met Cam, I was really trying to understand, like, I know what I want. And if it's not matching what I want or if the man doesn't know that he wants me, it's an immediate no. And what was really beautiful about Cam and my story is that we both were so open hearted and so willing to go with the flow and love spending time with each other that it didn't come from scarcity. It didn't come from, well, I'm single and you're single and we should just be together. It didn't come from that place at all. It was like we were both very willing to explore the dynamic that we had. And then it naturally blossomed into like the best love ever. But that happened because we were friends, because we loved spending time with each other 
And we didn't complicate our feelings with romance at first. So there was always so much love between you and I. Like even in the lizard yoga conversation, I was like, wow, I just love that person. Like I literally thought you were an angel. It's like, this is just an angel on earth. And you would call me that that same thing. And in the past, when I would meet someone I connected with so deeply, it would be like, oh, this has got to be it, right? Because I was seeing everything through the lens of like, where's my man? Where's my soulmate? Where's he going to drop out of the sky next? And because I had just let that go and said, I fully trust and believe that the person I'm meant to spend my life with will find me at the perfect time and will want to be with me as much as I want to be with them. And I was so committed to exploring the dynamic and having no attachment to it. Funny enough, this is why I'm sharing this. After this beautiful, deep, conversation at the Hyatt where it was me, Cam, Danny, Cole, and Cam and had that wild moment where we said nothing for five minutes and he said, I love you. And I said, I love you. And was like, what? The very next day, Cam wakes up. (laughs) I was on the treadmill. I get a text from Cam and he goes, good morning, Angel. I just got hit with a profound sense of clarity (laughs) because I had such strong feelings for you that I began to wonder if they were romantic. So I asked God if you were my person and I woke up today and he said that you're not. So I guess we're just soul siblings. And I just share this because (laughs) it's really funny and it's always been so funny to me. And when I got the text, I laughed out loud. Like, I just thought it was the funniest thing ever. So I was like, of course, like, who cares? I wasn't attached to whatever Cam and I were. I just loved being around him. I loved talking to him. So when he sent me that, I was like, okay, like, sure. And so I remember Danny texting me the same moment on the tread and said, why didn't you tell me it was romantic with Cameron? And I just said, it's not <laughs> because you said we were soul siblings. So I was like, okay, like if you say we're soul siblings, I guess we are. Uh, hey, bro, you know. So that was my my very much open hearted state of mind. I remember I literally laughed and extended my arms while power walking on the treadmill and was like, life is amazing. And we recently went back in this text exchange because I wanted to see exactly what Cam texted me. Oh, you you got it down. And I think- You, you got it word for word. Did I get word for word? Yeah. So good. And then I replied to this and I just said like, what a beautiful reflection. I love you so much. And I just sent him a song called The Blessing. And I was like, this is you. And I just could not give less of a shit. That's, that's what I want to emphasize to you is like, you have to get to the place where- you have no scarcity left in your body when it comes to love. Like you do not care. If a man comes into your field and is like super lovey-dovey with you and you're like, oh my God, like, could this be it? And then he's like, JK, you're my sister. A past version of me would be like, fuck off. I don't want anything to do with you. You misled me. It's It ain't that deep. Like, look at me, really feel this when I say this. Do not create stories in your head about a relationship that doesn't exist until it exists, baby. So at this point, Cam and I have an amazing time. He had confessed his love to me and then said he was my sister. Er, yeah, I was his sister. Yeah. And then he was my brother. And I was like, LOL, what a great story. Cannot wait to tell Danny about this one. And then look what happened. So yeah. after this exchange happened and I just let go and didn't care, Cam then started inviting me to like a bunch of things. He was like, Everything. Yeah, please tell I'm me. like, I just need to be around this person. Don't know why. <laughs> tell me she's my soul sister, not my soulmate. I just need to be around her because I have never felt this way around a person before. I don't know what this is, but it just feels good and feels right. And so I had like a list of gym classes, also a list of yoga classes I've been doing that week. I'm like, here's a schedule. Love for you to make any if you wanted to, whatever it is. You didn't show up a single one. I, You're like, thanks if I... I don't know if you said bro or something like that, which would be hilarious. But okay. But back to what I said 
about Please. your soul sister. Oh, you have to hear this because this is amazing. This, this is why you have to not be attached to the story. Because if you get attached to the story and you tell yourself, oh my gosh, like he fumbled, I'll never talk to him again, cut him out of your life, then you're not going to get to the juiciest part. So take and, it away. And baby. we're not saying that so that you always keep this hope. Oh, no. Yeah, that do is, not mishear me. No, no, no. But what we're saying is we're at peace with whatever outcome. Yes. We're at peace with what we don't get too attached to anything or anyone at any given moment. Yeah. We're at peace with whatever happens. But what happened, that was literally the most chaotic week and a half of my life. Ran the marathon, met you, went to Danny's retreat. I had an experience at Danny's retreat where um, I was able to understand that I have God-given gifts when it comes to being intuitive healer. And I don't, I don't want to call it an exorcism, but did something very similar to that for someone there for the first time. And it worked, it happened as if it happened through me, I had this whole shaking experience. He was a completely different person immediately after. And so I was in just complete shock. And the next night is when we had the dinner and the conversation with my dad and with you guys, I was like, I was low on sleep. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. This is amazing and also freaking scary. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, did I just meet the, the person I'm going to marry to? Like literally as I'm walking away from that dinner, you you give like, um, you know, Cole and Danny, you're a very living person, like a good hug. You hug me for like a minute as you're rubbing my back. And I'm like. They call me the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of huh. <laughs> Rizzler. <laughs> And I'm, I'm walking back to Cole's apartment. I'm like, bro, does she, you think she's some romantic there? So I, that was planted the seeds in my mind, but there's so much going on that I'm like, I woke up the next morning. That Okay. I went to bed that night and I said something to the tune of, God, this isn't my person, right? Mm -hmm. Please show me a sign. <laughs> this isn't my person. <laughs> and I woke up next day. Um, to an alarm clock that was scheduled way too early. And I'm like, <gasps> she's not my person. She's not my person. Sister, soul sister, not soul mate. Um, and so, yeah, that's when I texted you. And it was kind of a big relief for me because I'm like, okay, <laughs> I can't take the fact that I just found <laughs> potentially the person I'm going to marry. So I need to just chill out right now. I need to take the, like a week off. Something's happened in my life. I don't know what. And so it was so much that felt overwhelming that I was so quick to be like, no. Um, but then I'm like, wait, why do I want to hang out with this person so badly? <laughs> like more than anything, like I'll reset my whole calendar to spend five minutes with her. Um, and then, so you know, I send a list of, of things I'll be doing that week. She just want to come, which is kind of a weird thing. I've never done that before. Um, <laughs> but just for some reason, I'm like, fuck it. I'm done with all the rules. I'm not playing phone tag here. Like I need to see this woman. And so didn't respond to any of them. But then you invited me to the Kundalini Awakening thing? I did. And, okay, so, and I said yes to that. Uh-huh. I initially thought it would just be you and me to that. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm like, oh, I like to do kind of like a sauna session beforehand. And so, I scheduled a sauna session for the hour before, same place we met. And I'm like, I would love for you to come. And you said yes to that. And I'm like, fuck yes. And we go there. And of course, like, I get to see you in a bathing suit never. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> all right you know this is really testing how divine of a man i am like full eye contact the whole time you didn't slip i didn't one. break he did he's stronger than the marines my, my eyes on the face on the face and it was a solid session but we went way over board on time like they had to come knock on the door to get us out of there and then we're late to the cooling wake whatever it was but i'm like ah, this girl this girl something it's real simple. Mm -hmm. And we're laying to have a cool linking thing. We're all, it's kind of like a, you lay down yoga, a bunch of music, a bunch of um, the people, the practitioners there come um, kind of work with your body in some way to make sure it's all aligned properly. And that, that's a very low level thing of Kundalini, but that's not here or there right now. But at the end of the class, we all were at this position where we all have our eyes closed and we need to wake them. And, um, Everyone's awake, sitting back up, but Elle's just taking her time. It's like she's still napping or something on the side. Mm -hmm. And so her mats were next to mine because we came in late. We're at the very entrance of the class. I, I tap her like thigh or something like this. And I can see she goes from like being dead sleep to like opening and seeing me and then be like. <laughs> and then Lily like jumps into 
not even my arms because my arms weren't even open, but just jumps onto me. And like the moment when I saw her eyes go from like squinting to like, <gasps> I was like, oh, she in love. <laughs> like it's over. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. Ain't, ain't no soul sister doing that. <laughs> and so it was, it was huge. I was excited to see you. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> and then I don't know if it was a day later or a few days later, I had a call with a psychic. Susie. Psychic? Or is she? I call her psychic, yeah. I call her psychic. She very spiritual tapped in. She channels. She channels. Everything. So she can like basically read your energy and just tell you exactly what's going on in your life and where you're holding yourself back. Exactly. And it's as if she can kind of get this guidance that either the angels or souls or spirits looking over you that are open to, to saying to you in those moments that can guide you in different aspects of life. And I brought up L. I'm like, I have this very confusing situationship going on. And she, of course, like she knew who was with without me saying it or like what it was about. And she, all she said was, she looked up and she's like, they're telling me that this is the one thing you need to figure out in this lifetime. Like this is your thing. So normally, the, angels or souls above you would would, would be very adamant and, and ready to kind of tell you what you're ready to hear for the next aspect of life. But there are certain things that they they, they do this kind of sign of whisper with the, with the finger right here and smiling little smirk to where those are events, those are relationships or opportunities that we need to see out within ourselves because they're going to be huge pillars to our growth or you know, or everlasting love, whatever it may be. And so she said that about Elle, and that like, for some reason in my mind was just like, any level of fear or something that I had around this, I just need to drop it. I need mm -hmm. to fully pursue this. And then after that meeting ended, um, she said a bunch of other things that completely changed my life. I'm like, oh, I should double down on writing. I should do this, I should do this. And she brought words to the gifts that I had just recently found out that I had. It was, it was a beautiful experience, but, um, I was like, I need to see her again, I need to see her now, and I need to see if it's gonna be romantic. And so literally that day, and I've never done this before, I've never been this assertive, but I'm like. Really? No, I've never done it. It felt so natural. Yeah. Uh, I'm ready, I was ready. But I was like. Can you do the laugh? <laughs> <laughs> Is this like old football player turned a comedian who does it all the time? It's I love like, what you do. <laughs> I was big like five years ago, six years ago. but. So I, <laughs> her by, I was, I just texted her because we were already, we we're at like a good point. Oh, even before then, mm -hmm. we're sitting in the back after the Kundalini Awakening, we go out with a few friends mm -hmm. and we're sitting in the back of Talia's car. Yeah. And we're just like this close to each other. <laughs> and Talia midway through the conversation stops the car, looks back, is like, I don't know what's going on between you two, but I love it. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? We're just friends. And I'm like, she was picking up energy, whatever. Okay. Uh -huh. After the end of the call with, with Susie, I give you a call. No, I don't give you a call. I text you. I said, I'm coming over to your place tonight with Chipotle. Yes, you are. I'll see you at seven. I'm like, what's your Chipotle order? And you were like, okay. I was sat. I was sat. I was like, hmm, I'm curious to see how this is going to play out. Played so out pretty well. I, so I just said, okay. I think I said, um, I love a man who knows what he wants. Something like that. You know, because we both got a little Rizzler in us. Yeah. You got to understand. We're both Scorpios. This is all making a lot of sense when you know that. Yeah. Both creatures of intensity and depth and a little insanity. A little crazy. A little crazy in there. A little crazy. But a little passion. anyways, come over for Chipotle, end up smooching like an hour. Okay, and listen. That was a delayed smooch because oh. you told me a whole life story about yeah, like the, the insurance before. sales. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we were sitting at my bar stools and then I'm just thinking to myself, when's he going to go for it? I was thinking it and I was like, when's Mr. Assertive going to go in for the kiss? Hey, yeah, I did it. I, I shot my shot and it landed. And then he shot his shot. He went in for a kiss and it literally felt like we had kissed a million times. Yeah. It was like immediately just like, okay, now we're kissing. And now we're soulmates. It was like, all right. <laughs> no longer soul soul commence. And it we're just was like <laughs> incredibly comfortable and like so exciting and just like filled me with joy. I mean, every single time we kissed does that. 
I'm just like, this is awesome. Yeah. Can't get better than this. Yeah. But then you had gone on a trip, which is pretty wild. You'd gone on a trip to see. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about it. I went on a trip with a girl who I had a lot of spiritual conversations with. And <laughs> a girl that like I was potentially interested in dating. Yeah. And literally hours before um, going, I was like, oh, I'm going to marry Elle. <laughs> but I had the trip booked. I was seeing some of my friends there. And I'm like, I'm not going to cancel the trip. But so that was a whole awkward can of worms we'll talk about in a different time. Yeah, we could talk about that. But yeah. this goes to show you how fast things are just moved. Cam's life moved. Because, like, let's just recount this man was living in Bali. So he moved to Austin. He got his dream car, which is a Raptor truck which is so nice. And we love Reggie so much. Reginald Raptor got his dream car. He got his dream apartment by literally one Google search. He then stumbles into by walking. Like who just walks around? Cam yeah, does. Anymore, So yeah. Cam just walked into a yoga studio, bought a membership on the spot where he met me. Because he met me, he went on Danny's retreat. Because he went on Danny's retreat, his entire new life path was revealed to him. Like, it is incredible how fast your life moved in a series of, like, one month. Everything yeah. I just said happened in one month. Uncovered spiritual gifts. Healed mentors, somebody. Basically mentors. Basically performed exorcism. Yeah. Mentors reaching out. Becoming friends with people you listen to on podcasts with Justin and Danny. 100%. And now people who I've been following for years are now trying to get with me when it comes to like in my dms or whatever is trying to be friends not get with me don't, don't, uh, don't, don't get with it. but just like <laughs> the network in which you've always looked up to is now your network and you're like whoa exactly all in like a month all in a month yeah. and then on top of that i come into the picture and this man's like you're telling me all of this and this woman come in here so you can and understand peace hey <laughs> Come on. All right, all right. My bad. You're bad. My, my, I'll keep going. My bad. <laughs> I'd like to going. request more. <laughs> We're going to put a pin in that for now. <laughs> but yeah, it was a lot of a month, month and a half. And it's been a wild six months to say the least. It didn't get any slower. Let's put it that way. No. It didn't get any slower. But um, we're weathering the storm and it found a good balance now and we're doing well. How do you feel? Do you feel more stable now? Because so your life seriously changed. Every aspect of your life changed. But it's all in the right direction. Yeah. I tell people, imagine being in like a self-driving Tesla going 100 miles an hour. Um, and you're sitting in the driver's seat, but it doesn't feel like you're the one driving. But it's going in the direction towards the destination you've always wanted to go in. That's how my life has felt. Mm. Because the inner work, because I'm aligned, because I'm acting upon the highest version of myself, at least as close as I can in any given moment. That's how it's feeling, but it's going incredibly fast and quick, but literal miracles are happening all the time. Synchronicities every day. And um, it makes life a lot of fun and really beautiful. It's like a roller coaster ride that you know is gonna take you to where you wanna go. And so now all you gotta do is enjoy the ride. It's gonna be fast. Twists and turns, now you're expecting, but it's gonna be great. And, um, but yeah. I thankfully am able to do this so much easier because I have you. Like, if you are my rock in ways you don't even, you don't even know. And, um, yeah. I think, and just how I think I've unlocked a level of freedom for you, you are unlocking a level of freedom for me that will really allow us to catapult ourselves into becoming the highest version of ourselves for ourselves, for others, and for service to the world. And um, it's just, it's so amazing. I could not have written this story better. If I had to write down a list of what I was gonna do in the next six months, six months ago, I could not have imagined it being this fantastic. And now we're creating pro projects like this podcast and many others coming soon. It's just, it's a recipe for just an incredible, exciting, joyful, heavenly life. I'm so glad to be dealing with you. Baby. I wonder like one thing that you touched on earlier around the state of, of men and women. And I think we have a lot to talk about on both sides, but I would love to hear from your perspective. And I think that there's 
a lot of hubbub around people not wanting to have kids, people wanting to delay having committed relationships, especially among people your age who you're 24. And I wonder what made you feel like you were ready to run towards responsibility rather than delay it. If I were to go down the normal path of the average person, I also would be just as fearful of getting married, just as fearful of having kids. Um, but thankfully, I think it was just divinely chosen that I had the right parents, the right circumstances that would make me really question everything around me. And that has brought me to a different life, and different solutions, different opportunities that I've realized that we all have actually had the choice the entire time to live a life that's fully aligned with ourselves. And when the destination is a fully aligned life, you run towards everything that's necessary to get there. And so the responsibilities I'm taking upon buying a house, supporting you, soon to be kids, cars take care of, people take care of, soon to be probably dogs take care of, whatever it is, I am taking them on because they are all towards a direction that feels right to me. If I was making my money or whatever it was in a way that felt misaligned, if I was still doing insurance, whatever it was, I wouldn't be nearly as ready for this. But because I've done what's necessary to make sure everything is aligned, I just feel ready to put more on my plate because it's a plate of food that I love to eat. Mm. When you be eat shit your entire life, you don't want to put more shit in your plate. You know, uh, but there there is work, the inner work that needs to be done that improves the quality of food in your plate in this example and in real life, I guess. But um, that all comes from, I think, doing the inner work and really understanding that the world is telling you to be on defense. The world is telling you what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. The world is telling you what's possible. When all that is illusion. All that is bullshit to keep you down, to keep you in fear, to keep you hating others. And I'm very fortunate I've had the life experiences to show me that that is optional. That is a version of the video game I can play, but it's not the one that I'm going to choose. It's like people are, are choosing to play the game on hard mode when they don't have to. Mm. And um, that's a complete different story for a different time. But the more I run towards aligned responsibility with the right people, including you, the right opportunities, the right projects, the better man I become. And the more I receive endless amount of blessings from the universe. It's like, God, the universe, whoever's out there wants you to succeed. And they'll make the path incredibly clear. All you need to do is have is have the balls take the first step. And once you take the first step, synchronicities, miracles, and the whole entire pathway will light up for you. What, what would one of the first steps look like? Could that look like having a conversation you've been avoiding? Can that look like quitting a job that doesn't fulfill you? What, what could that look like? It's, it's look, the first thing is um, adopting something that gives you a level of awareness to see every part of your life that you're currently not in alignment with. And so it's looking in the mirror mm. and seeing, um, do I treat people the way I like to be treated? Am I doing things that bring me joy and that is in genuine service of others? And questions similar to that. And just um, once you see the parts that are incongruent to who you know, you, you know you're destined to be, taking the first step towards shifting those. I love that, baby. I think one thing that 
you've taught me a lot about is how to sharpen and listen to your intuition, which is really just nudges from the divine. And how if you use your feelings as a compass, you will create in all moments a life that lights you up. And that's one of the things and lessons that you taught me that ended up giving me the courage to quit my job. Because when I looked at my feelings as a true compass, you could even tell by how I was talking about my job earlier versus how I was talking about the walks and our great morning calls. My job at Facebook was keeping me safe. It was keeping me very comfortable. Um, I enjoyed it enough. And I think sometimes good enough is keeping you from finding what's perfectly aligned. Yeah. And if you can be really honest with yourself, I think I have so many friends and have talked to so many people on the walks that I host who are in positions of good enough who are afraid to leave them and change their situation, whether that's the work that they're doing, the job they're at, the partner they have, the friends they have. They are afraid to have a conversation or make a move that will make that thing fall away because they do not think something better will come in. You have a scarcity mindset around what you think is possible, what you know to be possible. And if I had not had the courage to say, I don't want good enough. I want what's made for me. My desire is divine. I want what I have worked to deserve, what I deserve by just being. And I don't have to compromise. I don't have to sacrifice. I don't have to be with someone who's everything that I want on paper, but doesn't feel right. You know, that when I made that decision, had that courage to make that move is when now everything in my life, literally all day long, is off of my feeling, off of my intuition, including you, including yeah. my partner and the love of my life. And that's why being around you is so easy. It's frictionless. That's how I describe our relationship philosophy is the love of your life is meant to feel easy. You are not meant to really try. You're not meant to struggle. You're not meant to miss each other and miscommunicate like two ships passing in the night. When you've done the work to call in someone who's also done in the work, you don't have friction because you're meeting each other soul to soul, heart to heart, and you don't have miscommunications. We're on the same page at all times, you and I. Like we don't miss a beat. You, you'll you read my mind and I'll read your mind. You do it all the time. Yeah. When you, I'll just look at you and you'll be like, you want to go to Chick-fil-A for our MoCo, which is a Diet Coke, by the way. And I'll be like, yes, oh my gosh. Or you'll be like, you want to go to eat at this certain restaurant? And it's exactly the one I'm thinking. It's like, you can just read my mind because we have no friction and yeah. no force. And I was only able to call in that dynamic because most, if not all areas of my life, we're coming from that place of no compromise. Yeah, most definitely. And the reason why we so easily compromise is because we believe we're not good enough or deserve anything better. Mm. Many of us have adopted a scarce mindset in an ever abundant world. The universe within itself, if you look at in the physics textbook, you see it's ever expanding. If we cut down a tree, it'll grow back. Like there's so many parts of every part of humanity, nature, they print billions of dollars a year, whatever it is, like everything that we want deeply is in abundance. But we've created stories in our head that make it as so we have a distorted view of reality that always has us living less of a life than what we can live. And I think it's just really important to realize like everything you've ever wanted and desired, you are capable of having. Mm. And if it is fully aligned, it will happen easily. Yeah. But this is also- And if it's not, it'll be hard. Exactly. Especially in relationships. I think if I can, if I've learned one thing through our dynamic and I understand being on the other side of finding your person is a very different emotional reality than waiting to find them. 
And that's why I hold everybody listening to this who has not found their person with so much love and compassion and understanding because I remember being in the place of like, I'm doing all of the work that I can. I truly am being so ho- open-hearted. What more can I do to call them in? And I remember that place. And it's funny to, to think back on it and just, if I could say anything to my former self in that place, it would be, give it time. Literally just give it time for the perfect moment, the perfect connection. You keep, if you keep really earnestly, and you got to be honest about this, Cam didn't just pop out of thin air. We met because we were both at a yoga studio. Okay. So hear me when I'm saying this. If you just sit at home all day and you do all the inner work and you're not putting yourself out there, that person is not going to find you. We need to be really honest with ourselves around what we are doing to put ourselves in the position to find the love of our life. Because you can do all the manifestation that you'd like and do all the journaling that you'd like and all the healing you'd like. But if you do not talk to people, the love of your life will not find you. So you have to expand your surface area for luck by putting yourself in positions like the place that you love most in your city. You can become a regular at your favorite spots. Just get really creative around where could I put myself out there more than I am today? And if you are doing all of that, this is the place that I'm speaking from. I was doing, I did all the preparation work to call in the the love of my life. And I was putting myself out there all the time. I host a weekly event that 50 to 100 people come to every single week, 10 to 20 of which I've never met before. So these are new connections I'm making. I was going to yoga studios. I was sitting in public so people could approach me. And you have to be putting in that foundational work of putting yourself out there and being unafraid and open-hearted and not closed off when people would come up to you, not seeing people as threats, not seeing men as scary, seeing every connection as an opportunity to open your heart a little bit more in order for that grand moment like Cam and I had at Lizard Yoga to happen. But if you're doing all of that, I promise you it will happen. But I know how annoying it is to hear this. I know how annoying it is for people to be like, don't worry, like it'll happen. I know, trust me, I used to be exactly in that position. But if you in good faith can say that you're doing everything I just said, it will happen. And if you're not, that's okay. We love you. We have no judgment. I was also in that position years ago, doing nothing and then being like, where's my Prince Charming? But we just got to be honest and we got to course correct or keep going down the path. That's why we, we bring this up. <laughs> and there's two things very important. We need to make sure we're acting upon, putting ourselves in situations and becoming the person necessary that we know will attract the person we know we deserve. Yeah. It's a huge part of it. Another part of it is maintaining the belief no matter how much time has passed, just because you haven't found the person in your given expectations of a few months or a few years or whatever it is, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Many people, and this is what causes the far majority of suffering in the world, they say, I'll believe it when I see it. Mm. You know, you need to believe it to see it. <laughs> if, if you believe, oh, I'll, I'll believe I can be successful once I'm successful. You're not ever going to be successful. You must have the belief before it turns into reality. And so one thing that's incredibly important to keep in mind is to not lose hope. Mm. I understand in a world that's constantly trying to make this future feel more and more hopeless, that it can be hard to feel that way. But I promise you, if you keep it top of mind and you do incremental actions every single day that build you into the person necessary to achieve whatever it is, whether it's relationships, business, whatever it may be, health, if you do those necessary actions while keeping that belief and also putting yourself in environments to where those opportunities can find you, they will. Yes. They will. And we know firsthand for all aspects of life, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth whatever time it takes. It's worth it. It is. And once you get there, so that that's the little precursor I had to give, but once you find the person, how you know is because you can feel it. You can just feel that there is no friction. You can feel that there's no forcing it. There's no, 
oh, I really like doing this thing and my my partner doesn't get it or they don't they they don't understand me or we fight all the time. No. 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 If it doesn't feel right, if even one part of you is like letting doubt creep in, it's just not the person. And they're probably a lesson for you. And in some cases, this lesson can go on for years, especially if the person is like 95% right. Because then the mind comes in, the mind's like, we can make it work. We this can, logically makes sense. We can, you know, this is so close. They I'm not going to find, boxes. exactly. I'm not going to find, you know, anything better of this person. And then you convince yourself that you have to force something. You have to force a square peg in a round hole. And that can be some of the most damaging at all at, of it all is because you have to put yourself in a position there to really believe that where there is friction, there is force. And where there is force, there is not power. And it's not the right situation for you. You have to believe, though, in order to make all that belief happen, that the person who it does feel absolutely frictionless and easy with exists. And they're also looking for you. You have to believe that. And if you don't believe that, and you bury the gut feeling that's telling you, your signal that's telling you, maybe this isn't right, even though it's so close, it's just not right. And sometimes it's not close at all, by the way. Sometimes the signs are hitting you, like we like to joke, yeah. It starts that, you know, the universe will send you a tomato thrown your way. It then it'll send you a brick. It'll be like, leave. And then it'll send you a Mack truck that'll be like, you're gone. You got to get out of this relationship. So for a lot of people, that could be like the tomato is you keep fighting all the time. Like everything's a fight. You even fight about where you go to dinner. Then the brick would be, oh, I found out that he's talking to other girls on Instagram DMs. And that's a little sketchy right? Then the Mack truck is, he cheated on me, right? That's just an example. But you shouldn't have to get to the Mack truck. You don't have to, to wait until it's really, really bad to leave. The only reason why we're waiting is we believe that there's not something better for us in their end. Exactly. And we're like, oh, well, I'm 34 and, you know, only got time to take in. kids, yeah. And, you know, that's removing, that's stopping the universe from being able to gift you the person you're ready for at the perfect time. Right. If we're putting restraints on the miracles or gifts or blessings, that's what will happen. And so just don't settle. Oh, yeah. Just don't settle. Yeah. And again, it, it works both ways. You can't ask for everything and expect to receive it if you yourself are sitting at home on your couch. And if you're not embodying them. So I think this is what people miss. I mean, all of the, what we're saying comes with so much nuance, but I think people really miss this part where you'll say, oh, women have too high of a standard. And that's why they're not in these relationships and they're not having kids and they because they're not settling. I have seen arguments against what we're saying, but what you have to understand is we are not saying do not settle, period. We're saying do not settle if you are someone who will do the inner work to uncover all of your wounds, insecurities, and pain points and get to the point where you make a list of all the characteristics you want in the love of your life and you become it. We are talking to that person. We are not talking to the delusional person who is going to sit at home and cross their fingers and try to do a summoning circle for their soulmate without ever leaving their house. We are not talking to delusional people. We are talking, and God, I love the Delulus, by the way. No judgment there, but like, that's not who we're talking to. We are saying do not settle if you are putting yourself in the position not to settle. So I just want to make that clear, because I think a lot of people will hear what we're saying and be like, this is why everybody is childless. No. <laughs> Stop it. Yeah. Everyone around you will impose their scarcity beliefs on the world but they're oftentimes not the people who you want to be. Listen to people that have everything you want or are everything you want more, more in particular. Listen to what they're saying. They're all going to be talking about this, this exact mindset of abundance because yes. this mindset of abundance is needed to attract everything you've ever wanted. Yeah. 
And I think what's important too, and this is what I want Listen Before Love as a series to give people, is it really, really bothers me when we have so much generalized relationship advice where you know, we love those channels that are like meet cutes on the street of New York City where they go up to old couples who've been married for 40 years and you ask them for advice. But the truth is, we don't know their relationship dynamic. Have they been married for 40 years and they don't sleep in the same room and are absolutely miserable? Or are they madly in love? And would knowing that answer to that change whether or not you take their advice? It would definitely change if I take their advice or not. So what I want Listen Before Love to operate as is if you resonate with the dynamic Cam and I have, take our advice. But we also want to bring in other couples who have different dynamics, different relationship philosophies, so that if you don't see yourself in us, that's perfectly okay. Our dynamic, what we explained throughout this entire thing, might not be for everyone, and that's perfectly fine. But if you do resonate with our energy and the relationship dynamic that we have is something that you would want for yourself and you really see yourself in us, then maybe listen to what we're saying, more so than any of the other generalized relationship advice that you see. So, in, in this series, what I really hope we can do is to create a catalog of different relationship dynamics and philosophies so that anyone can hear and say, oh, this is what this couple's energy feels like. This is what he does. This is what she does. This is what they did to find each other. This is what they feel like to me. I feel like I can see my personality in both of them. I want a man just like Cam or I want a woman just like Elle. Or the complete opposite. <laughs> or the opposite. That's okay too. Or I hate these people <laughs> and I want nothing to do with these people. That's perfect too because you could just listen to us and do the opposite of what we're saying. So that's also Amazing. Whatever you get out of this is absolutely perfect. But just so that you know the direction we're going to take, it may start with just Cam and I because we're here and we got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to we talk, talk about. about this stuff literally all Honestly, day. we're like over time right now yeah. and we could keep going for a very long time, but we are going to cut it here and just let you know there's so much more to come cam and i maybe the first couple of these episodes just riffing on what we were talking about and so much more we didn't even get into masculine and feminine energy dynamics we didn't even really explore our relationship dynamic in depth a little bit but i think what we covered today was so awesome so it's a great first episode we had no idea what we were going to talk about and i'm just so excited about how it went and i loved i just love talking to you you're my favorite person in the world you serious? So. Yeah, yeah you serious? actually um, Yes, actually. Well, actually. Very nice. Yes. Well, okay. <laughs> Everything is reciprocated. I love you so much, baby. And this went very, very well. I'm excited for hopefully making hundreds of these episodes because this is something that I really enjoy. And I'm so glad we can finally do on camera in front of a microphone. So, which, by the way, just as a little footnote, it's uh, it's one of our shared fears well not so much cam anymore because he gets on camera and he records instagram videos one instagram video every day because he gets on camera and says to go ahead and do it okay get ready for this every single day for the past like 93 days i've been like day 92 of telling you you were loved and you're enough hope you have an amazing day so what i've done in the past handful of months is create whether it's newsletters or short videos and also long form videos that help me overcome any fear or anxiety I have around being on camera because I know yeah. the impact I want to have in the world is going to involve us being on people's phones, being yeah. in public, being on camera, and to overcome any level of fear or anxiety I have so I can be my full authentic self for others is has been something I've been doing for the past handful of months that has completely changed how I show up on these things to really be my full authentic self. Yeah. And so I'm so, so proud of you and the leaps and bounds you make when it comes to that over the past handful of months ever since I've known you. And just like, I just know the more authentic we become, the better podcast this will be. And what makes it such a great podcast is the ability in which we're going to be able to serve thousands and hopefully millions one day. So Yee, I'm very grateful. So I'm very optimistic about the future. Me I love too, you too, baby. Yeah, it's just, he's taught me so much and just not being afraid to be seen. And I think a lot of the time when you have a really rich perspective and it's not that we aren't good speakers or we can't find things to talk about, quite the contrary, we could talk for a very long time, but it's more about being ready to be seen. And you have helped me so tremendously feel safe to be my full authentic self because if no one likes me, then my baby likes me and my I baby understands me and you love me and I don't care about anybody else. Good so way. it's just like so beautiful to have you in my life for that reason. So now I'm willing to go on camera and be seen by massive amounts of people. Lucky y'all. 
<laughs> I get this 24 7. All right, that's it. Thank you all so much for tuning in for, to the first edition of Listen Before Love podcast. We look forward to seeing you all soon. We love you all conditionally. We love you. Bye bye. bye.